helps if I add myself to the stream. No, uh, oh, great. Left the light off back there too. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's uh, a good night if it happens to be there. It's now 9.07 here in Korea. I'm Legal Vices and welcome and I am dragging ass today. Um, wow, as many of you know, there was a typhoon, a big typhoon that uh, blew its way through town yesterday and uh, I got about one hour of sleep. Uh, and then I had to go on Andrew legal mindsets show this morning, my time. And then as soon as I finished that, I had to go do a full day's work. Well, I'm well, like half day's work. We, we got to go in late. Um, so yeah. And I, I just passed out on the couch. I, I got home, ate, ate some dinner, just crashed. And then I, I woke up immediately before I was supposed to be here. So that, that's why it, uh, that's why it took me a little bit of time to get here. Um, wow. So we've got a, we've got a, uh, a lot of things to do. There's been a lot of conversation going on back here and just, just glancing, just glancing at it. It, uh, looks like, uh, there's some, some per personal problems, personal troubles here with, uh, with Alan, one of our mods, uh, what, whatever it is, um, you know, gosh, Best, uh, be best of luck getting that uh, worked out whatever way it needs to get worked out for you. Um, you say, uh, just, sorry, I'm not with it tonight. I'm so sorry. Hey, that's uh, you know, any night anybody's here is kind of a shock to me. So, hey, you got to take care of yourself first. Um, dang, even my hat's not on right. You got to take care of yourself first. That's the most important thing. So you know, don't, don't have to be, don't apologize for being here, not being here, being with it while you're here and not being with it while you're not here. Um, you know, you got to take care of your, got to take care of yourself first. Uh, a few things before we get going again, got to apologize for dragging ass today. Cause it's just, it's just rough. <laughs> it, it was a, it was a very rough day today. Um, second, I think I'm not sure. Uh, yesterday, I believe I missed a super chat from Drew Bradley. Uh, Drew, if you're here or if you see this later, I apologize if I missed it. Uh, I was looking back through through the uh, analytics stuff today and I saw a super chat that I don't remember reading. So just in case I didn't, Drew Bradley gave a, a super chat yesterday that said, uh, thank you. I really do enjoy your content and expertise and uh Ince is all it says here. Uh, let me jump okay. uh, Thank you. I really do enjoy your content and expertise and inside scoop of these. Helps me with my fear of boating. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was from Drew Bradley, and I'm not sure I mentioned that yesterday. And if I didn't, I deeply apologize for that. Uh, and if you haven't noticed, due to uh, popular demand, due to requests from all of you, the Vice Squad, we have a new emoji. We have the tinfoil hat emoji that was asked for. Uh, you can never go wrong with a good tinfoil hat emoji for our Friday, our uh, unexplained Friday show with, with uh, Fair and Balance. So if you want to check out the, there we go. There's the tinfoil hat emoji, emoji from Rose. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, now those, let me bring this up here real quick. I don't want to make any mistakes. Yeah, we have 140 members currently, so thank you all so much for that. And most of those came by way of gifts from you amazing people to other amazing people. Um, these, All of these emojis that I have were made by uh, one of our regular, regular viewers, John Byrne. John Byrne has made all of these emojis that we've been using. So thank you very much for those, John, and uh, especially for the quick turnaround on the tinfoil hat thing. We've got a couple of, we, well, not a couple, we have one other person who's talking about emojis. So we, there might be even some more emojis from other people coming down the pike too. But uh, these have all been John Burns so far. So thank you so much for that, uh, for that, John. That is deeply appreciated. Uh, very quick turnaround time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Ooh, got to get myself uh, in order. I just, it's just, it's a loopy day. Um, very quickly, because we have a lot of ground to cover. We've got about two hours of Marsha Clark to handle on the OJ Simpson side of things. Um, so we'll just get everything out of the way we need to get out of the way really quick. John, hey, John, you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the shout out, LV. Hey, thank you for the emojis. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, I'm glad to have all of you, even though you know not everybody's day is perfect. 
Um, Alan, whatever it is you're going through, sorry to, you know, sorry to hear about it and hope, uh, hope things work out. Um, <clears throat> all right. I am Legal Vices. This is my channel. We are talking OJ Simpson tonight. Last time, if you recall, we were here. We, uh, we, we uh, talked about the background of the trial, uh, the alleged murder. Well, they weren't alleged murders. Uh, the, they were the murders and who allegedly committed them. Uh, we talked about the famous Bronco chase, the white Bronco chase. Then we went through Chris Darden's opening statements for the prosecution. I gave him a D. If, if there was something between a D and a D minus, that's what I would have given him. I would have given him. I gave him a D for most of it, and then I sort of kind of downgraded him to a D minus by the end. Um, I, I thought his his argument was structured incorrectly. Um, he was talking about the big details at the beginning, and then he was you know the. He, he was talking about how he was how OJ Simpson was was abusive and committing DV and controlling and manipulating, and then he would spend tens of minutes just rambling about one particular incident, weird details that had nothing to do with the crime. Um, he his voice was really slow and really monotone through the whole thing, and it it uh, got really, really bad to the point where we had to, uh, <laughs> sorry to do that to you, where we had to put him on 1.25 speed uh, to make him sound kind of normal, but he still had that uh, that monotone to his voice, so he, he was not a persuasive speaker. He, he wasn't emphasizing words. He wasn't pounding home particular points, and the weirdest thing of all is he spent a good three to five minutes at the very, very beginning telling the jury I mean, accurately that whatever the lawyers say during their opening statements isn't considered to be evidence. Boom. That's all. He, that is all he had to say. Whatever we say, we're just, we're telling you where we're going with this case. We're giving you a roadmap. What we're saying now is not evidence and shouldn't be considered evidence. And then you move on. He spent three to five minutes saying, whatever we say, don't pay attention to what we say. Don't, don't, Trust anything we say. Don't uh, consider whatever we say evidence. Don't take it to the jury with you, room with you. Whatever we say, whatever the defense says is not evidence. It's not. So basically he spends five minutes telling them to ignore everything he says. And then he goes on to tell them that uh, the guy in the other chair is a murderer. Um, so yeah, it was really, really weird. It was really, really bad. And it wasn't as good as I remember. It wasn't as good. Yeah, it wasn't as good as I remember. I don't remember it being that bad at the time. Um. But I promised we would get on with, with uh, Marsha Clark today because they broke it up into two. Uh, Chris Darden spoke first, and uh, Marsha Clark spoke second. Uh, we have a super chat from Mortimer Duke. OJ, wow, back when a Kardashian was just an attorney. Yeah, we talked about the Kardashian too, Robert Kardashian, father of Kim and uh, everyone else, in, except for allegedly one of the Kardashians. Um, you know, the the unfounded theory goes that she may be someone else's but uh as far as i'm concerned they're all his uh <laughs> oh flux you're coming in with a quick one too here thank you so much it's a weird day for all of us we got a really bad storm here in maryland right now okay that's what i thought because you know the when you sent me the dm on twitter you said you got my storm i'm like what i <laughs> you just meant a storm generally i thought you meant you got my typhoon that's what i'm like where the hell are you i don't <laughs> I don't want to go to work. The roads are flooding and Panther prison. Yeah, it was so hot here last night because you had to have all the windows closed. Uh, the power went out about 4.30, 5 in the morning. I can't remember what time power went out. Couldn't have the fan on. Everything is closed up. It's hot and muggy and humid AF. And I got this gigantic heat rash on my chest and it was just scratching the hell out of it. But yeah, so... Uh, that's why I couldn't sleep mainly because once I did get to sleep, the power goes out. I get this rash. I'm itching it. As soon as I finally go, oh, my God, the, the typhoon is broke. I can go to sleep. The dogs woke up. And then Andrew stream started. So, yeah, poor poor me. I know. But it was just a long day. Uh, everybody seems to be having some some issues today. There's just one of those days when people have issues. Uh, if you're not having issues, good for you. Um, right. Before we dive into this, let's take a look at the current state of affairs. We've got 130 concurrent viewers right now, 56 likes. That means almost two-thirds of you haven't done your job. Get down there and hit that like button. 
We need we need to like this. We need to get those likes up right about to 131 right now, right off the bat. Hit that like button. That's what we need for YouTube to pay attention to us and get us uh, get us noticed. And if you haven't subscribed, I'm assuming everybody here now has subscribed uh, because you got the notification and showed up. But if you're just wandering in off the uh, proverbial streets, if you're just kind of coming in out of the internet rain. And this is your first time here. Hit that subscribe button if you like what we do. We do lots of this kind of stuff. Tomorrow, I will have Andrew from Legal Mindset on my channel where we're going to talk about Korea, uh, Korean issues, Korean societal issues, societal issues in general, and pizza. <laughs> and we'll, we'll be talking about a lot of things with Andrew. Uh, Thursday, Thursday night, U.S. time, Friday morning this time, I will be on uh, Good Logic's channel. And I'm still trying to get uh, still trying to get Nick on here after that. Uh, Nick Ricada from Ricada Law. Uh, still, tr hopefully, I'm shooting for Thursday, and I hope he can do it. Uh, Friday will be fair and balanced. I'll be over on Fair and Balanced channel for the Unexplained, and I'll do something on my channel. I I said it. I said out what I was going to do, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I have to think about it. I didn't write it down, and I forgot. So, all right, with that, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button, and as always. The best way of getting in touch with me, best way of making sure I answer your question, best way I, I read your statement and comment out whatever is the Super Chats not required. There's no minimum amount that you have to gift to pay me to talk to you. I try to watch the chat. Not always possible. I miss a lot of the questions, but the Super Chats bring it up in nice bright colors. Uh, all right. With that out of the way. We will stop that particular grift and get on with the regularly scheduled program. Uh, part two of the prosecution, prosecution's opening statements by Marsha Clark in the people of the state of California versus OJ Simpson. And the dogs are here. So if you hear the snoring, the heavy breathing, the licking, the chomping, whatever it is, it's all the bulldogs, uh, not me. All right. We need to bring up this part, the last part of this day's proceedings. Here we are. And Marsha Clark, do Marsha Clark go. And he sat there facing the cold. Oh, dear. I, he just sat there staring at I, I, I won't. I won't make you go through three minutes of Christopher Darden again. Hear it and see it and process it. You'll see that cycle of violence. You'll see how things escalated. You'll see how controlling he is. And you'll see why he was killed on June 12. This is not character assassination. This is not some tabloid prosecution. The evidence you will hear in this case will be evidence of this defendant's life his conduct, the things he did. You hear evidence of his relationship with one of the victims. Yeah, Are, are you being moved to want to prosecute this guy? Are you being you moved to want to find him guilty? To Clark, you see how it is that Ron Goldman happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, there was a murder. To, so, someone last, last week said it sounded like evidence, he was giving the see, weather in San Diego. That his decision to kill finally was merely a final link in a progressive chain of abusive and controlling conduct. Hey, Law Patrol, welcome. Another person who's not having the best of days is, a, and is Law Patrol. And mental abuse and economic abuse and control and stalking. And you'll see that there was a common scheme, a common plan in all of this. And that was to control. I just wanted you all to, to remember. Remember, Chris. He's almost done. It was all designed just to control her. See, and he, yeah. So her, everybody that's day. having a bad day, good luck, Five cheer up, days. hope everything's better. And again, like we talked about this last time, a really quick break in. The he he gets lost, and he just stops, and you can see the hamsters running in the wheels in his brain, and then he just has like this little bout of verbal diarrhea while he tries to collect his thought. And it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. Whatever the reason, whatever the reason he does this, whether it's inexperience, whether it's, you know, he, he's freaked out by the cameras, whatever it is, it's not good. 
Oh, defend Ant. We forgot to defend Ant. Made of that final ultimate act of control. She left him. She was no longer in his control. He was obsessed with her. He could not stand to lose her. And so he murdered her. That's a pretty big leap. And as you hear the evidence in this case, it will become clear that in his mind, she belongs. When he to stops him. talking, it feels like time stops and too. And if he couldn't have her, then nobody could. I mean, can you see how the how you can deliver that? You you have. He was abusive, he was controlling, and he ultimately decided that she didn't want him, and if he can't have her, no one will, so he killed her. He murdered her in cold blood, and he also killed Ron Goldman, who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You can do that, or you can go, oh, well, you know, he was controlling. Um, he couldn't have her, and he decided that if I can't have her, then... No one will. Those are two pretty diverse and differing ways of delivering the same line. Show some passion. Show the jury you think this guy is a monster. Thank you. No, thank you. You got a D minus. And you, even OJ is like, what was that? And meanwhile, you know, Shapiro is trying to stay awake. <coughs> now we got Marsha, F. Lee Bailey. What a guy. Cochran back there. More of the team. Barry Sheck and Kardashian are just over here off to the side by the bailiff. Marsha Clark standing up. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> There's Daddy Kardashian back there. I haven't seen Mr. Darden. He was busy with other matters, and uh, he is an integral member of our team. Let me introduce some of the other lawyers you haven't met yet, but you will be seeing through the course of this trial. Mr. Hank Goldberg. Mr. Woody Clark. And Mr. Rodney Harmon. That's as good as we're getting on the volume. She gets they better later. We're presenting the scientific evidence in this case that relates to the blood analysis and DNA testing. Yeah, I was in law school when they brought the, the verdict in, and they brought all, everybody the into the uh, moot courtroom and, and played the verdict. Very much for their able assistance thus far. Of course, you know Mr. Hodgman, He's still here. You've now heard the why. You've heard why. Why would Renthal James Simpson, a man who seemingly had it all, commit such heinous and don't start off by pronouncing the defendant's name wrong. Renthal. Uh, you know, not good. But um, who was where to go? Oh, yeah. Libby S. asks, do you think if it was Vasquez and Chu, the results would be different? Well, I think they'd certainly have a much better chance at it. Um, we'll talk about as, as we go through and play the different things. Like next time, it'll be the defense side. Uh, and then we'll kind of hit some of the evidence going through. But I think they would have presented the evidence a little bit differently. They could read the room a little bit better. Yeah, we've got all this. Can you boost the sound? Like I said, that sound is up. And she, she gets on top of the mic here. Crimes. Throw it all away. The one simple truth about the evidence described to you by Mr. Darden is that it shows that Mr. Simpson is a man not a stereotype, but flesh and blood who can do both good and evil. Being wealthy, being famous cannot change one simple truth. He's a person and people have good sides and bad sides. That's a very Whether good strategy. Both sides are not. Both sides are always there. She has to do this. She has to show that there's good and bad in him. And I, I think she did a very good job at this because she... He was a freaking hero to most males on earth at that time. And a lot of the ladies found him pretty darn easy on the eyes. 
So he had a huge support, a huge. And if you would just walk in telling people their idol is nothing but pure evil, they're remembering his movie roles. They're remembering his athleticism in college when he won the Heisman Trophy. They're remembering his professional career. It was a huge standout. So you have to do this. And this was very smart to say, yeah, he's got a good side, too, but he's also got an evil, evil side. Now, we will show you the other side of the smiling face you saw on the Hertz commercial, the one you never saw on camera, the one none of us ever wanted to see. And that was the side that went from Rockingham at his estate to Nicole's home at 875 South Bundy on the night of June the 12th, Doxing. 1994. It's a 1995 perm right that there. that night, many events were happening at the same time. And in order to give you a true picture, the most clear and accurate picture of what really happened, how the events occurred, I'm going to go back and forth between the parties and between the locations. So what I want to do, first of all, is describe the setting for you. As of June the 12th, 1994, Nicole was living at 875 South Bundy in Brentwood. That's a condominium. It was a duplex. And so it's one building. She had one side, had a common wall, and her neighbors had another side. She lived there with her two children, Justin and Sydney. The defendant was living at 360 Rockingham Avenue in Brentwood. Brian Kalen, known as Cato, you some of you already are familiar with the name, was living in one of the guest units behind the defendant's home on Rockingham Avenue. The defendant's daughter, Arnell, lived next to Cato in another one of the guest units. I'll show you a diagram a little bit later to get you more familiar with the location, but the guest units are behind and apart from the main house, and they share common walls. It's kind of like one long building. So Cato had one, and then Arnell had the next one. Now, the background on Cato and the evidence we'll show you uh, is the following. Cato met Nicole in 1992 after she had left the defendant at a party in Aspen. They remained friendly after that point, not romantically, platonic, just friends. And he went to a party that she gave him, Gretna Green, in 1993. He noticed that that house had a guest unit behind it that was a separate living quarters. And he asked Nicole if he could rent that that location. She said yes. She rented it to him for $450 to $500 a month, and he was allowed to reduce that amount if he did babysitting for her. He was very good with the children. So Cato Kalin was one of the original grifters, man. He he had it good. He's just kind of basically living for free off of OJ's dime in in uh Nicole's backyard. <laughs> so I mean, in, in OJ's backyard. So, yeah, you know, he's, he had a good deal going. But that was an arrangement that worked well for everyone. However, Nicole decided to move out of Gretna Green in 1994, and she found the residence on Bundy that uh, I described Lumber to you. Lumber now, Lumber yeah, she's talking straight at the jury. Quarters with its own entrance and exit, but it didn't. It was all under one roof. It didn't have a separate living quarter like the other house did on Gretna Green. The defendant asked Cato not to stay there, not to live under the same roof as Nicole, saying it wouldn't be appropriate. And he asked Cato to come stay in one of the guest units at his house on Rockingham. He told Cato he could stay there for free. Grifter! Cato obviously saw a much better financial situation for himself and agreed. And so in January of 1994, Cato moved to the guest unit behind the defendant's house on Rockingham, and Nicole moved to 875 South Bundy. Let me show you a board now of the Rockingham location. Her name was Sarah Paulson. Her name was Sarah Paulson. <laughs> nice. <laughs> ah, yes, old technology. Wow. There you go. There's some old courtroom technology for you. A giant poster. Uh, that's what we did back in the day there. I mean, look at these gigantic CT monitors. A few people have some pro laptop prototypes that 
just look like bricks. Uh, but yeah, hey, that's it. That's how we used to do it back in the old analog days. Get, make a poster. It's like a you know show and tell. Diagram of the defendant's home on Rockingham Avenue in Brentwood. Glue sticks. <laughs> this location here, this area here, is the main house. This, these rooms that are shown down here, are the guest units. Now the guest units close off. They are, they are locked off with a door so that you can't enter from the guest unit into the main house. You see the uh, area here, it's marked Kaylin's room. I don't know if you can all read it. That's why I'm pointing to it for you. That is Cato's guest unit. Right next to his unit so is a... Mark, if you look on your step over to your uh, right so that he can see what you're pointing at. This is, thank you, Ron. This is an office that Cato had access to. And this would be our Nell's room, right next to Cato's. <coughs> now, the Rockingham address also had, it had a gate that opened onto Ashford Street on the north and a gate that opened onto Rockingham on the west side. I'll get into more detail about it a little bit later. Now, before I really get into the events of the night. And pointers. Of June the 12th. Cardboard and pointers. And into all the details. There are a few key points that I want to bring out to you right now. I'll come back to them again, but I want you to bear them in mind. This has to do with the timing of the events that happened that night. You're going to hear a lot of talking about that throughout this trial. I think I can guarantee that. With respect to the timing. We will, the evidence will show that on the night of June the 12th, 1994, the defendant had an hour and 10 minutes of time in which his whereabouts are unaccounted for. And we will show that it was during that hour and 10 minutes that the murders were committed. And so the evidence will prove that Cato last saw the defendant on the night of June the 12th at 9.35 at the latest. He did not see the defendant again until 10, excuse me, after 11 o'clock. In between those two times, at 10.15, a dog is heard barking that the evidence will show was Nicole's dog which fixes the time at which the murder occurred. At 10.45, Cato heard thumps on his wall. And shortly after 11, he saw the defendant. Cato Kalen heard thumps on his wall. Uh, I'm going to start taking notes of what we need to bring on. Cato Kalen heard mysterious lump, you know, bumps on, on the wall. Um, I've got a theory, so I think we need to watch some Cato Kalen too. An hour and 10 minutes during which the murder occurred, murders occurred, in which the defendant's whereabouts are unaccounted for. I'll come back to that point. Now, on the night of June the 12th, as uh, Mr. Darden has already described to you, that was the recital for Sydney. It was a dance recital for her school. Can any of you remember that there was a a recital at his daughter's school that Chris Darden talked about? I doubt it because nobody was paying attention to what Chris Darden was saying. They tuned in him out after 10 minutes after he after he told everybody not to pay attention to him not to listen to what he was saying and not to consider anything evidence and then he droned on nobody nobody remembers a thing he talked about on the morning of june the 12th the defendant played golf played cards and he was scheduled to go to the recital at 5 p.m on the evening of june the 12th i doubt it mr darden described to you how the defendant behaved that night he was in an ugly mood, morose, depressed. 
and clearly fixated on his ex-wife, Nicole Brown. He returned home after the recital and he spoke to Cato. It was approximately 6.30 to 7 p.m. He returned home to his home on Rockingham. Now at about that same time, 6.30 to 7 p.m., Nicole was arriving at the Mezzaluna with her party. Mezzaluna is the restaurant where Ron Madison Goldman worked. Now, when, now back at Rockingham, Mr. Simpson spoke to Cato. He discussed with him with the recital, but he wanted to tell him about it, and he mentioned to him that Nicole was wearing a tight dress, and he wondered how she'd look in that tight dress when she got to be older. During the course of that day, he also told Cato that he and Nicole were through. It's important to remember that the defendant would make statements sounding like he was cavalier about it. But the truth hey, Darth Hideous, come back and watch the replay. Is that he was not at all cavalier about losing his soul. Now, while the defendant is talking to Cato on Rockingham, Nicole and her party arrived at the Mezzaluna for dinner to celebrate Sydney's recital. Ron Goldman was a waiter at the Mezzaluna. He didn't wait on her table that night but he was working there that night. Nicole was wearing a black halter dress and a black blazer. She left the restaurant with her family at approximately 8.30 p.m. Now between 8.30 and 9 p.m., Cato was back in his room and the defendant came out to his room to ask him for some change. The defendant was set to take a flight out that night to Chicago, an 11.45 red eye. He indicated to Cato that he only had... That's Ron Goldman's parents. He needed smaller change for the sky cap. He asked Cato if he had that smaller change, and Cato said he did. He then told Cato that he was going to go out and get something to eat. Cato asked if he could come along. The defendant said, okay. They Cato is the Isaac Baruch of this trial. They went out to the driveway... The defendant drove to McDonald's in his black Bentley. That style and going to Bentley and you're and going to McDonald's in your back, Bentley. The defendant ate his food while he was <laughs> driving. Cato did not. They got back to 360 Rockingham and the defendant parked his Bentley in the driveway in the same position in which it was found by the police in the early morning hours of June 13th. When Cato got out of the car, it was 9.30 to 9.35 at the latest. And when he got out of the car, we last saw the defendant standing near the Bentley. Cato walked through the driveway, through the side yard, and back to his room. As soon as he got back to his room, he made a call to his friend in San Diego at 9.37. So we know that the defendant got home between 9.30 to 9.35 at the very latest based on the timing of the phone call that Cato placed to his friend in San Diego. When Cato left the defendant standing at the Bentley at 9.35, he did not see the defendant again until after 11 p.m. Now what I'm about to describe okay, to you so is we're a looking series at, of events. We're looking at an hour and a half. An hour and a half. You got to keep that in mind. If you say that he was last seen around 930 or 935, you have to give the defendant the benefit of the doubt. So you have to give the last possible. That's that's where you have to start these things. So if, if it was between 9 and 935, you have to consider that 935 was the last time that OJ was seen. And then 11 o'clock is like an hour and a half later. So that's that's the window of opportunity. D wanted, I never knew I had a fetish for perms until now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the real Hydro PX, you should bring on Barnes. You should bring Barnes on. He says OJ is innocent, and I would love to hear his side of the story. Followed up with Valhalla Waits. I'm starting to think Barnes is trolling. He never gets into why he thinks OJ was innocent. I'll get it. See, I, d does, he, d does he say OJ was innocent, or does he say that OJ is not guilty, or does he say what I say? 
What I say is the state did not meet their burden of proof to prove that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't know uh, Barnes was was outspoken on OJ. I'll I'll I'll, I'll send Ty any uh, message and see if he wants to join us uh, next time or the time after that. Okay, Barnes says innocent. He, all right. And break out your popcorn here with Duran, a super sticker. Got the popcorn sticker. Thank you so much. All right. Well, if he says he's innocent, I'd like, I'd like to. Maybe we should do that towards the end or towards the middle uh, of this and uh, have him come on and we can discuss it in detail. That would be fun. All right. Th th thanks for the suggestion, guys. That's what we'll do. I'll ask him and see if he, if we can arrange a time. If he wants to, and then see if we can arrange a time. Between 935 and 1045 on the night of June the 12th. So now we've narrowed it down between 935 and, and 1045. Time, the defendant's whereabouts are unaccounted for. At 937. It's an hour and 10 minutes. Judith of Brown, that is Nicole's mother, called the Mezzaluna to see if they had found her prescription glasses that she thought she had left there at dinner that night. Karen Crawford, the bar manager for Mezzaluna, took that call and then went to look for the glasses. I saw your comment on there, Digger. She found them out in the gutter near where the family had gotten out of their car to come into the restaurant. She brought them back into the restaurant, told Judith that she had found them. Judith asked her to keep the glasses there. So Ms. Crawford put them into an envelope marked Nicole Simpson prescription glasses. We'll show you photographs of that envelope today. Now, I Judith didn't. called Nicole at 9.40 p.m. and told her that the glasses had been found and were being kept at the Mezzaluna at 9.40 p.m. And that was the last time Judith ever spoke to her daughter, Nicole. So we know she was alive later, around 9.40. Ms. Crawford received a call from Nicole and they spoke. Ms. Crawford then called Ron Goldman over to the phone. Ron Goldman spoke to Nicole for a few minutes, and when he was done and he hung up, Ms. Crawford gave him the glasses, and he took the envelope containing those glasses. Shortly thereafter, at approximately 9.50 p.m., Ron Goldman left the restaurant still dressed in his waiter's uniform, the white dress shirt, the black pants, and the black shoes. And his friends at the restaurant never again saw him alive. So let's say that was 940 called, talked to him. So let's say 950 was the last time someone saw him alive. That leaves us a 55 minute window. Which graphic is this? This is uh, OJ's mom call? back there in the hat. All right, what item, what exhibit? What exhibit number? Just All right, we don't care what exhibit number. Pablo Fenves, who lived at approximately 10.15 p.m., Pablo Fenves, who lived diagonally across the alley behind Nicole's condominium, heard a dog begin to bark. The area you see here in the photograph, and I'm trying to designate it with the red light, this is alley behind her house, behind Nicole's house at 875 South Bundy. This Jeep that you see here is her Jeep. Pablo Fenves, whom I've just described, lived in the area where you see the police car. The lights that you see here on the balcony indicate where Nicole lived. That's her condominium. This is a rear view, again, of Nicole's, the, the uh, rear of Nicole's condominium. That so amazing laser that's pointer her technology. Garage that I'm indicating. And this is the balcony area I've indicated before, and there's the upstairs area. So we still have these these overhead projectors here. Two. This this garage and these living quarters here belong to another family. As I indicated before, it's a duplex. So at 1015, Pablo Fendez heard a dog bark. He remembered it clearly because the bark was like a plaintive, insistent wail. It was like nothing he'd ever heard before. 
Although he'd heard dogs barking in the neighborhood often, other dogs lived in that neighborhood. This was different. This bark sounded to him like a dog in trouble. At 11 p.m., when Pablo Fendez went to bed, the dog was still barking. He went over to his back to his bedroom shutters and opened them to look out in the direction that the barking seemed to be coming from. And he looked in the direction of Nicole's condominium, which is the direction it seemed to be coming from. And he noticed that, he noticed that there were lights on <clears throat> in the upper floor of her condo. When he fell asleep shortly after 11 o'clock, the dog was still barking. The evidence will show that this dog wailing and barking so insistently was Nicole's white Akita, Cato. <laughs> like the dog after Steve the Schwab tenant. left to take his dog for a walk at approximately 1030. At about 1055, when he got to the corner of Dorothy and Bundy, which is right on the corner of Nicole's, uh, where Nicole lived, maybe one house down, he saw Cato the dog walking alone. The dog was acting very agitated, seemed to be barking at the house on the corner of Dorothy and Bundy. He couldn't tell which one. And he noticed that the dog had an expensive collar. When he checked it further, looking for tags, he noticed that there was blood on the paws and on the legs of the dog. Although at that time he saw no injury, he assumed there must have been a cut on the paw to cause all that blood. As he continued to walk, the dog began to follow him, but it behaved in a very strange manner because at the, st at the walkway to every house that they passed, the dog would stop and bark insistently. When Steve got home at approximately 11.05, he and his wife discussed what to do with this dog. They sat outside, gave it some water because it seemed very dehydrated and decided to try and get it to lead them to its owner's home. So they took it out and they started to walk back, but as- See, she's doing such a, she's doing a much better job at storytelling than Chris Darden was. I I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm actually interested in hearing where this story is going. Taking notes of the times, taking notice of who was doing what, but I'm still interested in what the story is. What, where's this story going? Tell me more, Marsha. Tell me more rather than, God, Chris, would you just shut up? <laughs> Take me to your leader. <laughs> I thought Kato was a dog and that was the twist. <laughs> There's more than one Kato. Dun, dun, dun. So, yeah, I think she, she's doing a much better job in pulling you into the story, in narrating what happened on that night. Darden did none of that. He was all over the damn time map. I think she's showing some emotion. She's showing some intensity. She's not getting, and unfortunately that's a problem that women lawyers have. It, it, and I think it was, it was really, really evident in the, in the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial where you had two lawyers, two women lawyers, two female lawyers to compare and contrast. You, 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 women run the risk and it's just, it's just a thing. I, and I don't know if I, I have no idea where it comes from, but women can sound very, very bitchy. If they try to get too emotional, they can sound bitchy and whiny and naggy. And it, that's a real, real risk. If you, you, you can show intensity, but I mean, it, it's a completely unfair thing, but that's just a thing. It's just a, it's a natural reaction. I don't know what it is or why it is. But if you look at Camille Vasquez, how she presented her arguments, she had the passion, she had the intensity, and she had the ability to do it professionally and in, in a way that did not sound you know bitchy or whiny or naggy at all. It sounded very, very forceful and very, very impactful. But on the other hand, you had... Alain Bredehoff, who did just sound like an old nag. She just sounded like a miserable hag that you didn't want to listen to. To the point like where you're you're just like, why are you why are you being so mean to an accountant, you ornery old bitch? You know, why are you being mean to this guy? She always sounded mean, unpleasant, and just nasty. And so it's a thing, and I think I think Marsha is is doing what she's uh, what she's very familiar with. She's showing the emotion through the 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 intensity in her language. I mean, 
you can say that, oh, yeah, you, he killed her in a monotone voice. Or you say he killed her in a monotone voice, but putting different emphasis on different things. I think she did a good job. I think she's showing emotion, but in a way that's not going to come across as a naggy woman. And, I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, but it, it's, it's just one of those things. Whereas guys, on the other hand, just kind of, they, they come off sounding like weak, weak wussies like Chris Darden did. Rather than you know, forceful, powerful, in control male, they sound like wusses. You discount the wusses, whereas you di you tend people tend to, to discount or not pay enough credence to women if they start to sound a little bit you know emotional or you know kind of that naggy thing. It is we're just wired in weird ways, but I think she's doing a good job. Oh, uh, flux two bucks. Thank you so much, Lux. Marsha got the shit end of the stick on this one. She kind of did. She did. She she made a lot of mistakes, no doubt. She made a lot of mistakes. Um, but again, she was she was kind of the uh, she was kind of the rotten born of this trial. She was better than Darden, but she tied herself to Darden, and she had to live with it. As they neared Bundy, the dog resisted. The dog pulled back, and they couldn't get it to go any farther. So they took the dog back to the courtyard of their apartment building. Now in that courtyard, there was more light and they were able to see more clearly that there was no injury on the dog, but that its paws and its legs were clearly bloody. Now Steve Schwab later gave that dog to another neighbor in his apartment building, Sukru Bostepi. You'll see them testify in this courtroom. And Sukru Bostepi agreed to take care of the dog for the night. But again, the dog was acting very agitated with Sukru Bostepi. He tried to take him inside the apartment, and he was sniffing and scratching and trying to get out. So he tried to do the same thing that Steve did. And he took the dog out for a walk, hoping it would lead him back to the owner's home. As they went south on Bundy, the dog started pulling harder and harder until they got to the location of 875 South Bundy. And there at the pathway leading up to that home, the dog stopped and the dog looked up the pathway and that made Suku look up the pathway. And there he saw a sight that he'll never forget. He saw the body of Nicole Brown lying at the foot of the steps in a pool of blood. Now I'm going to backtrack for a moment and talk about Rockingham. I last See, here's the difference. Again, this is one of the differences between how the cameras in the courtroom used to be and how they are now. This camera is roving. There's a cameraman that could be distracting people by moving the camera around. These were not small cameras back in the day. These were giant t television cameras. Uh, so he's up on you know, the it's up on the stand there, and it, it's being moved around. So you don't see the cameras panning around the courtroom much like this. You, you'll see mostly. One on the one on the judge, one on whatever lawyer is speaking, one on the defendant, and maybe one out showing out towards the audience. But they're mostly all static, except for the one on the lawyer. And you know that's how they always cut to when they when they leave the courtroom and goes up to the court crest and whatnot. So I mean, this is just random courtroom where you they're talking about horrible shitty things that happened to Ron and Nicole. So the camera will zoom in on the faces of Ron and Nicole's parents while they're talking about these things. You know, when they're talking about what the defendant did, they zoom in on OJ's face. You don't, this was like the, the this was the early days. This is when they were still getting, uh, figuring out how to effectively and properly use cameras in the courtroom. Let's mention Cato. Old white dude. Uh, is it, what do you, oh, old white dude. You, you mean this guy here, F. Lee Bailey? F. Lee Bailey is a legend. We talked a little bit about F. Lee Bailey last time. Dude, dude would never cry. He would make you cry. <laughs> he's, he's seen it and done it all. At 937, he was on the phone to his friend in San Diego. He was on that phone for seven minutes. That call ended at 944, at which point, after trying to use a typewriter in that office I showed you before, which is right next to his guest unit. This must be the room right here. He called his friend Rachel Ferreira.
uh, part. Um, it goes into, it's kind of better to break through. That's all right. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our recess for the lunch hour. Ms. Clark, could you take the uh, poster down, please? Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, take our recess for the lunch hour. Please remember my admonition to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Talk to anybody about the case or allow anybody to talk to you about it. And we will see you back here at 1.30. All right, have a nice lunch. All right. Well, look, at least that happened. That's where that's where this came from, probably. <laughs> the old camera panning to the state steel. I think is it. Right, yeah. Good afternoon, council. Is there anything we need to address before? Did you see that? That's what we don't. That's what we don't see enough of it in videotapes these days. We we don't see that videotape splicing edit there. All right. Good afternoon, council. Is there anything we need to address before we invite the jurors to rejoin us, Mr. Cochran? Mr. Cochran. Well, they took their morning break, so I'll take I'll take the uh, I'll take the evening grift break right here now. Uh, hey, what do we got going on? We've got 249 uh, concurrent viewers uh, and 141 likes. So 100 of you just need to go down there and slap that like button real quick. Uh, wow. My dog just moved and moved the entire desk. Uh, newcomer XX making use of the tinfoil hat, which uh, became the, the source of our most recent emoji for members. Uh, thank you so much for the super sticker, the submerged hippos. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, reach down there, hit that like button, like this thing, let YouTube know we're not doing too bad of a deal. Uh, they, would, they would appreciate that, I'm sure. And they would put us up in there. In their algorithm, uh, hit the notification button and the subscribe button, and uh, do whatever you need to do with the super chats to to ask questions, talk, and just throw random amounts of cash at me. That's all. Uh, back to our regularly scheduled program. Oh wait, do we have a hot? Oops, we missed a comment here. I wanted to make based on the trial. I agree with the jury. Based on OJ's post-trial book, that's a different story. Um, yeah. Uh, OJ is kind of the, uh, kind of the Amber Heard just can't shut up person, uh, except he got off. If you get away with murder, that was, yeah. or if you, if you, if you beat a murder rap, let's put it the way, if you beat a murder charge, shut the fuck up and go away. If, if, the, if, if I was wrongly accused of a murder, uh, assuming he was wrongly accused, and I won. You'd probably never hear from me again. <laughs> I would disappear forever. Uh, but no, he's got to say, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to finding the real killers, which apparently live on Southern Florida golf courses. Um, and then he publishes his book. Uh, what, what, what was it called? If I, if I had done it or if I did it, which he basically, this mother effer lines out in a book how he would have done it if he had done it. Know what I'm saying? He literally wrote a book about how he would have killed her if he had actually killed her. But of course, he had nothing to do with it. That's, uh, uh, why would you do that? I mean, just why? Oh, Lord. All right, back, back to the testimony. The opening statement, sorry, not testimony. You, County, Chris Darden told me that. Uh, this morning, Your Honor, um, I received oh. several calls regarding the witness, Rosa Lopez. And uh, at noon, I spoke with her personally. She indicates she's being besieged by uh, individuals who are trying to uh, either interview her. The press is outside of her house. She can't get out of her uh, driveway or her, uh, where she works. She's very, very afraid that in these harsh economic times that uh, she may lose her job. Uh, her lawyer, Carl Jones, has written a letter asking that should the people want to interview her, he'll arrange it and not to try to come on her job. She is a uh, works as a uh, housekeeper and she's I don't know what the court can do about the press, but she was really. Uh, we, 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 we have some response or comments. All right. Back to the statements. We don't need to hear this minor whining about press and. Our technical support. All right. 
Let's go, Marsh. And Judge, we're having technical issues. Get the jury back in. Simpson matter. Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel. People are represented, and we have all the members of our jury panel again present with us. Ms. Clark, do you wish to continue your opening statement? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I forgot to introduce a very important member of our team, and I sincerely apologize for that. Jonathan Fairlow, he's a new member of our office. That's why he she forgot him. The, and the uh, new the guy. work that you're seeing here. I wouldn't have a clue how to operate these things without him. I'm in serious trouble. I hope you all had a very good lunch. Let me remind you of where we left off so that. Now, remember, these jurors, as we talked about last time, were sequestered for nine months. For 265 days, they were sequestered in a hotel, sharing a television, going to lunch, breakfast and dinner together, driving everywhere together. <laughs> boomer she she's beyond boomer she well, she was about 40 when this happened so i guess she would have been a boomer then and yeah, she was around 40 when she did the trial she's 69 now 69 for 69 marcia you can pick up from there we were talking about the timing and i was discussing with you that cato had last seen the defendant at 9 35 at rockingham and that an hour and 10 minutes and that it was after 11 before he saw him again so he, let, he saw the defendant at 9.35, did not see him again until after 11. And during that period of time, the defendant's whereabouts are unaccounted for. Now, last I spoke to you, Cato was on the phone with his girlfriend, Rachel Ferreira. At that time, at that same time that he was on the telephone, and this was approximately 10 to 10.15, Alan Park, a limousine driver, was on his way to Rockingham to pick up the defendant to take him to the airport where he would take his flight at 11.45 to Chicago. Now, although his instructions were to arrive at Rockingham at 10.45, he hadn't been in the Brentwood area before and he didn't want to be late. So he left early and he arrived at Rockingham at 10.25. Now I'm gonna use the diagram again It's a di what's a diorama? It's the diorama rama. He parked across the street from the defendant's residence, got out of his car, sat behind it on the curb, and had a cigarette. Ooh, Janice Driver remembers. He, got back in his car at about he was a good witness. Sat in his car for a few minutes listening to the radio, and at 10:35, he decided that he would go and look at the Rockingham gate to see if that drive-in would be easier for him than the Ashford Street uh, gate. What I should tell you right here is that he was driving a stretch limousine and that has a very hard time making tight curves. He wanted to be able to pull up the front <laughs> door. Spankings for all the jury. Baggage. And so he wanted to see if he Hey, man, this was 90s hot. More easy for him. This was 90s heroin chick, you know. So he decided to pull down to Rockingham. Pulled the limousine down to Rockingham, all the way down to the point where the driver's side window would be parallel with the Rockingham gate, so he could look inside. Now, in doing that, he had to pass right by the curb area just north of the Rockingham gate. And what he noticed when he pulled to that area that was right in his field of view is that there was no car parked there. No white Ford Bronco, and it was 10:39. That's very important. We'll come back to that again. He looked down the driveway, and he saw that that looked like a tighter turn even than Ashford. So he backed the limousine up Rockingham Avenue, and made a left turn onto the Ashford Street, and pulled right up to the Ashford Gate. When I say he pulled right up to the Ashford Gate. 
On this photograph, you see the Ashford Gate of the defendant's residence. He actually had the grill of the car almost touching the gate, facing inward toward it. I hope you gave the court. It, it's P29. Uh, right, <laughs> Officer, grab your junk is still in the background. <laughs> Well, I think, the rec I think you should make the record, counsel. You should tell us which this is. Because the clerk can't see, the clerk has the list. She can't yeah. see directly the, the video. So you, you know, need to tell me which video you're using, which uh, graphic you're using. Very well, Your Honor. I'll ask that Jonathan Fairlow be allowed to. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, come on, Marsha. That's a rookie move there. Hey, Holly Midlife, welcome. Now that's a that's a rookie move to, to not tell them. You should say okay, referring to evidence, you know, whatever exhibit, whatever. She's like, okay, on this picture. He's like, well, what picture? Well, they had they know what evidence number. Well, it needs to be on the record. Somebody reads the record. They're like, well, what the hell picture is she referring to? And then she grudging like, okay, a judge, whatever. And that's what she should be doing. She knows she should be doing. She just hadn't been doing it. I mean, that's there's no excuse for not doing that. Name your exhibit and then talk about it. Now, when Alan Park pulled back through the Ashford Gate, parking up against it, facing into the driveway, he looked at his watch, and it was 10.40 p.m. At that point, at that point, he decided to go and ring the buzzer. I wanted to show you something else on there so you'll know what I'm talking about when I say ring the buzzer. And the next thing with this red light, you see right here, that's the call box. Will you be pressing the buzzer? Not really that I recall. And it inside the house. The person inside can then press a button to open the gate. I don't recall a lot of these kind of things. At 10.40, he began to ring the buzzer. He could hear its sound, but there was no answer. There were lights on. Oh, we, we, we have a, a meme copium raid here. Hey, meme copium viewers, welcome aboard. Good to have you here. We're going through the prosecutor's opening statements in the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, part two. So great, we, we got a co we've got a copium meme, a meme copium raid. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome aboard. Sit back and enjoy the ride. And while you're here, make sure you hit the like button because that's why you're here. <laughs> Raiders, hit that like button. We just uh, jumped to 272 concurrent viewers and only 183 likes. So 100 of you get down there, hit that like button. Uh, boom. Oh, we've, we've got some new subscribers suddenly too. Thank you for the meme copium new subscribers. That's what we're looking for. Uh, right now, we are listening to Marsha Clark give the prosecutors the concluding part of the prosecutors' opening statements in the trial of the people of California versus O.J. Simpson in the murder trial of O.J. Simpson from 1995. Um, again, the, for those of you that are just joining, hate to do this for the third time for you that have been sitting through this whole thing. But for the newcomers, um, I try to read the, tra the, the chat as much as possible and respond to questions and issues. But if there's a uh, if there's a question you really want answered or something really important you want to have to say, or if you just want to do it for whatever whatever the hell reason you have in mind, uh, super chats are the way to go. Super chats are guaranteed to be read. Legal mindset is here too. Welcome aboard, legal mindset. Uh, and. <laughs> How can I have the collar on the suit? Uh, I'm not didn't didn't see what happened before that. But uh, for those of you that are that, that heard earlier, I will have legal mindset on tomorrow, where we're going to be talking about Korea, things Korean, Korean society, society in general, um, what wherever the random discussions that we always have end up, and we will also be addressing the issue of pizza. Can't get through tomorrow without pizza. <laughs> so it'll be 9 p.m. Korea time, which will be 1 p.m. London time, uh, 8 p.m. 8 a.m. Eastern time, and 10 p.m. Australia time. So, all right, uh, that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. So let's jump back in with this. 
Uh, and we'll we'll see where Marsha takes us. You know, she's she's referring to some evidence. She's talking about how the limo driver came to pick up O.J. Simpson, wasn't there. Uh, he drove around, didn't see a car, decided he was going to park and then go and ring the doorbell at right around 1040 p.m. In the upstairs, one light on upstairs, there were no lights on downstairs. It seemed to him like no one was home, and he was a little worried about that, so he decided to page his boss and find out if perhaps the plans had changed. At 10.43, he paged his boss. He was then worried that perhaps the page didn't go through, so at 10.49... <laughs> remember pagers? <laughs> remember, remember pagers? <laughs> That was back when you couldn't afford it. You couldn't. You we well, couldn't carry a phone because they were a brick. And even if you had access to a brick phone, uh, you couldn't afford the bajillion dollars a minute to to give and receive calls. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody had pagers, and I think we were talking about. We, God, I was talking about this with somebody on somebody's stream, but that was back in the day when. Uh, when beepers, when pagers were in the earlier stages here in Korea, there would be like little collar rings where girls would call each other so that their pagers would go, mm, 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 repeatedly for uh, personal satisfaction purposes. <laughs> At home, but there was no answer. He then got out and pushed the buzzer at the Ashford gate a few more times. Still got no answer. Now, during this period of time, Cato is still in his room on the phone with his girlfriend, Rachel. Now, what I haven't explained to you yet, this area here shown, this is the southern border. Oh, pager codes, too. Sorry to interrupt. This is a thing. I, the, you know, Koreans had this pager code thing down to a T, especially like deaf Koreans. Deaf Koreans would use like text codes to send each other messages. They could, they could have phone conversations that nobody else could have because they, they, they had all these codes built in. We should, we should talk about that one of these days, like Korean pager codes. Those were, those were kind of fun and interesting. Of the defendant's property. This is a walkway here, but it's not like a sidewalk. It's very narrow and it's very dark. Just a few feet wide covered with leaves. It has the shrubbery that's indicated here. It's actually from the neighbor's yard. And there's a chain link fence. The shrubbery's right up against it. It overhangs the walk to make it very dark. Here you can see what's indicated as an air conditioner. I don't know if you can all read it, but that's what's written here. This little black box here. Now, if you remember, she said that Kate, Caitlin, Caitlin heard a, a thud on his back wall. Into Kato's wall. So you can see the air conditioner on the inside, and then it hangs outside the wall, uh, outside the house, over that walkway. So that this wall of Cato's room faces onto the south walkway. There is no entry or exit there. He can't go out that way. If he wants to exit his room, he has to exit through the doors that are right here. They're like shuttered doors. Like shutters, door-like shutters. Yeah, we know what shutters are, Marsh. Those shuttered doors to the pool area, and that's how he exits. So on that night, he's on the phone with his girlfriend, Rachel. Andrew, I sent you a link if you want to join in on the on the, the, the watch party over here. <laughs> okay, what's indicated here? P what? P4. What's indicated here? Is oh, hey, the look, there's, there's Darden, Chris Darden here, who screws the case. Discovery from the neighbor's yard. And the chain link fence. Thank you, 200 watt studio. And this is the air conditioner right here that I'm circling. <clears throat> that air conditioner is for Kato's room. It's set into his wall. This is the walkway. You can see how dark and narrow it is. This is a shot taken during the daytime. Now, uh, we'll, as soon as we have a better view, we'll, we'll introduce you to the, the crowd of people here. <clears throat> At 10.45, Cato was talking to his girlfriend, Rachel, when suddenly he heard on the wall 
where the air conditioner was, three loud thumps. The thumps were so loud. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. The picture on that wall actually moved. Cato was alarmed. He asked Rachel, have we had an earthquake? When she said she hadn't felt any, he became even more alarmed. And then he wondered if there might be a prowler, somebody trying to break in. Because Now, again, the people that are here know about it uh, because we've already talked about it. But this this gentleman back here, uh, this, this lawyer, this, this tangential O.J. Simpson lawyer is known to everybody. Well, he's not known, but his family is. This is Robert Kardashian, father of Kim and... Most of the other, for sh for sure, most of the other Kardashians. There, of course, is the unsubstantiated rumor that I personally don't subscribe to that Kylie may be the defendant's child. Uh, yep, that is that is Mr. Kardashian here. Because if it wasn't an earthquake, that's what it had to be. He was worried about the sounds he had heard. He was worried about those thumping noises. And so he decided that even though he was afraid and it was late at night and it was Chloe. dark, he should go and see what the cause of those noises might be. A few minutes later, he hung up with Rachel and went out of his room to go and look. Pete. Yeah. I, this is a picture of Cato's room. I didn't mean to say Kylie. I, I meant Chloe. I, I pride myself in not knowing who the damn Kardashians are. Okay. But yeah, Chloe was the one. In the, wall. the part of the wall that you can't see in this photograph is really actually over here. The opposite side of the bed is where the picture was hanging that moved when the thumps were made. The, some and people may say. To. You can see them here at the left edge of this photograph. See them better here. This is taken from the head of the bed facing outward. These are the shuttered doors that lead out to the pool area. Five. Don't make me get my stick out. Doors and out through the pool area, coming out onto the side lawn that borders Ashford Street. She's built like a running back. <laughs> when he came out to that side yard. That's just mean. Shame on you, you degenerate. He saw the limousine that was pulled up to the Ashford gate. Get it, T D degenerate. The defendant had already made Never contact mind. with him, was about to let him in anyway, and didn't pay any further attention because he was very distracted by what the cause of those noises might be. Now, with him, he had a little dim flashlight that he was going to use to try and see what was going on back there in the dark. In the meantime, just before Cato came out onto the side yard, Alan Park was standing at the Ashford gate, ringing the buzzer, still getting no answer. Finally, he heard the car phone ringing inside his car, and it was 10.52. He had still received no answer to the buzzing at the Ashford gate. Got back into the car and spoke to his boss, telling his boss, I don't think anybody's home. What shall I do? His boss told him to wait a little longer. And when he'd been speaking to his boss for three minutes, he saw Cato coming out the side yard with his little flashlight. So now we're at, we're at 1055. And if you remember, OJ had ordered the limo to be there at 1045 because he had to get to the airport for an 1145 flight. Thank <laughs> Thank you so much, 200 Watt Studios. OJ went from hurt to hurt. Now, all you youngsters that don't remember OJ Simpson, he used to be the spokesman for Hertz Rent a Car, and that was like his deal because he was like, you know, Mr. He was Mr. Football Player. Uh, he'd be like running through the airports trying to get to the Hertz uh, counter and things. So that was his deal. Yeah. So that's that's the joke. If you have to explain it, it's not funny, kind of a joke, but that's funny. He went from Hertz to Hertz. Almost simultaneously. With seeing Cato in the side yard, he saw a person six foot tall, 200 pounds. No, that was the 90s, that heroin woman, chic. African American walked quickly up the driveway and into the front door entrance. Okay, so. So there you go. 
10 55 is right there at that moment is when they allegedly saw oj simpson or a black man run across the driveway and into oj's house so that gives us from the last time that someone had seen him or talked to him was around 935 but the dog was barking at 1015 and he shows back up at 1052 so can he get from point A to point B murder the heck out of two people and get back all in the space of about an hour and 20 minutes. Immediately as that person entered the house, the downstairs lights went on. Alan Park hung up the phone. Alan Parkins project. That's a, it's a good band. Buzzed again. This time he got an answer. And the defendant said a voice that Alan could recognize as the defendant's. The defendant said, sorry, I overslept. I just got out of the shower. I'll be down in one minute. Hmm. A lie. Or was it? Now, Cato, who was distracted by the possibility of a prowler, wasn't looking to see if anyone was coming and didn't see. He just wanted to watch OJ in the Alan shower. Clark could not see well enough at the time the person entered the house to identify who it was. Clearly, that was the defendant. Uh, yeah, clearly, I don't know. Clearly, but again, this is the opening statement. She can say things like clearly. She just has to prove later that it clearly was him. She can say whatever the hell she wants, essentially, during these opening statements. She can say clearly this was OJ having just murdered his ex-wife and a restaurant guy running into his house to dispose of. She can say whatever she wants. She just has to prove later that it clearly was him. And as 200 Watt Studio said, Chris Darden there, sitting there thinking, in two months, I'm going to make him put on the gloves. It was a lot longer than two months. <laughs> it was like nine months. The, th this trial was 11 months long. The jury was sequestered for 265 days for nine of those months. And this is opening statement. So, yeah, that uh, that glove moment happened like eight and a half months later. But so he had to he had eight and a half months to think I'm going to make it put those that, that glove on. Thank you so much, 200 Watt Studio, for that super chat. Deeply, deeply appreciated. Now, while Alan was standing at the gate speaking to the defendant on the intercom, Cato decided to walk around to the south side of the garage and he was going to attempt to go down that narrow walkway to see what had happened. But when he got actually back to this corner of the garage with that little dim flashlight, it was very dark and he was scared. So he decided not to. When he came uh, back around, he was scared. When he came back around, he realized that the limo driver was still outside the gate. So even though the defendant had spoken to him and said he was coming down, he did not open the gate for him. Cato had to go and open the gate. He opened the gate and he let him pull in. As soon as Alan Park pulled the limousine into the driveway, Cato, who was still very worried about the sounds, started talking to him, telling him he'd heard the thumps on his wall. His picture moved. He thought it might be a prowler or maybe was it an earthquake? Had Alan been felt an earthquake? Alan said, no, I haven't. Cato was very nervous. But now, with Alan pulled into the driveway and inside the grounds, he felt a little safer. So Cato decided to go back to the area and try and check out the sounds and what, what it caused them. If he went back to the south side of the garage, he went through a first gate that basically you just lift and push against the wall. It's not a locking gate. Went up as far as a second gate, but couldn't see anything. It was still dark. The flashlight was very dim, and he decided to come back. He was still too afraid to go back there by himself. Cato came back out around the garage, and when he came out, he saw that the defendant had come out of the house by that time. The defendant was now wearing a light blue denim shirt and light blue denim jeans. Or as we call it, the Canadian tuxedo. A little too much denim there, OJ. 
Only, only a murderer would wear that much denim. Just saying. As he came out, Cato also noticed that there was a small dark bag placed near where the Rolls Royce. How many jurors got morning sickness and wild emotions? <laughs> towards Rockingham. Got, got morning there sickness and wild emotions. Grass near that Bentley. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> While they were, it was Alan, Park, and Cato who were loading all of the bags into the limousine. And while they were loading the bags into the limousine, Alan, uh, Cato spoke again. Oh, come bumper. on. You guys are killing me. Stop it. Oh, my God. We still got another hour to get through this. What are, oh, Lord. We, we've got to hurry. This is, don't do this to me. Thank you so much, 200 watt. People don't realize Marsha Clark is the younger version of Judge Judy. Queen of doily collars. <laughs> the queen of doily collars. N nice doily collar blast there, 200 watt studio. Um, so and being worried that it was a prowler, thinking it might have been an earthquake, hoping, I guess, it was an earthquake. <laughs> so he asked the defendant for a better flashlight so he could go around to the back area and check out the source of those sounds again. He and the defendant then walked into the house very briefly. But then the defendant said, oh, it's late. i got to go. He came back out. While they were loading the bags, Cato offered to go and get that small dark bag on the grass and put it in the car for the defendant. Unlike any of the other bags, the defendant said, no, 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 I'll go get it. He went and got the bag. The defendant got the bag and put it into the car. I don't like people touching my bags either. That doesn't mean that I murdered someone and had now, my murder clothes the in the did bag. Not give Cato a better flashlight. And when he left, although Cato seemed very concerned about the thumbs, the defendant seemed relatively unconcerned. He got into the limousine and they left for the airport at approximately 11.15. Now let me back up for a minute. Just before he left, the defendant asked Cato to set the alarm. Cato said he didn't want to do that. He'd never set the alarm before. He didn't know the code. He felt very uncomfortable with the responsibility. Told the defendant, no, I, I, I really don't want to do that. Don't want to set the alarm. Just the beep, 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 beep. Left. Star sign done. They took out, they left out the Rockingham gate at 11.15. Cato is not Asian. I, I, I can't remember what Cato's real name is. But uh, they basically named it, this is like nicknamed Cato after Cato from the Pink Panther series, if I recall correctly. Just, you know, the, the, the house guest that was always there with, with Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> uh, 200 watts again. Small dark bag is what I nicknamed my, Jer uh, my Nigerian, Nigerian ex girlfriend. Um, uh, <clears throat> moving right along. Yikes. Cato went back to his room to call back his girlfriend, Rachel Ferreira, as he promised to do. K Bruce Lee was Cato the in the, the airport, uh, Green Lantern. The defendant repeatedly complained of being hot. Alan Park could see that he was sweating, and he rolled down the windows and turned on the air conditioner. I'm complaining about night, you being hot, Marcia. Degrees. During that drive to the airport, Alan could see... That the Brian, that's right. Around with his bags in the passenger compartment. Thank you, Kimmy. Although he couldn't see exactly what he was doing. They arrived at the airport at 11:30, and that small dark bag that the defendant insisted on putting in the car himself was never seen again after the defendant left for Chicago. Hmm. Now, during the time the defendant was driving to the airport, Cato was on the phone again with his girlfriend Rachel. During that phone call, there was a call waiting interruption. The call was interrupted by the defendant. The defendant told him, I need you to set the alarm. I forgot to set the alarm. He had to give Cato the security code and tell him where to go and set the alarm. There was a keypad outside the front entrance, the front door. Now, in the six months that Cato had been living there, the defendant had never asked him to set the alarm before. I'd never had to give him the security code before. This was the very first time that had ever happened. Now, at this point, we know the following.
talk to you about the timing again. Again, good job of summing up. She tells some compelling stories. She presents something in a positive light. I mean, in a positive light for the prosecution. She paints a good picture. And she's not really slow, monotone like Chris Darden was. She presents it well. She presents a good, logical progression of a story. And now she's summarizing it. She's summarizing the salient points. That's one of the things you want to do as an effective speaker. Say so you tell them, tell them again, and then tell them what you told them. So re you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. Keep it pounding it in their heads. Live Xander, thank you so much for the super chat. I sent you an email on some recent interviews of Cato and Adam Carolla show. And Cato interviewed, interviewing the lead investigator. Thanks for the content. Yeah, K Cato is still famous for being Cato 30 years later. I mean, 27 years later. Uh, thanks for sending those. I'll check them out. Oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. Marsha presented to Darden, rumor has it. Thanks again, 200 Watt Studio, I think. <laughs> Cato last saw the defendant at 9.35 <laughs> when he was standing by that black Bentley after they'd come back from McDonald's. 40 minutes later, at 10.15, we hear Nicole's dog barking, that loud, insistent bark that went on and on and on. And it would be safe to assume that it was very shortly within that period of time that the murders mm -hmm. occurred. When Alan Park drove over to Rockingham and saw that the defendant's Bronco was not there at the Rockingham gate, it was 1039. And so we know that the defendant had not yet returned home. The drive to Rocky, between Rockingham and Bundy was timed, taking a normal rate of speed. I must admit, I like, I like the new tinfoil hat emojis. I like those. Approximately six minutes. Here's Nicole's condominium, 875 South. This is an, er an early prototype of Google Maps known as Maps. Bundy. Here's the defendant's residence, 360 North Rockingham. All right. For the record, this is a blow-up of the Thomas Brothers map. Yes, map of Redwood. This is what maps used to look like when you had to fold them 16 different ways and somehow jam them into the glove box of your car. Yeah. Wouldn't it be wild if they had like street views back then and there was like a street view of just like bodies on the stairs? So at 9.35, <laughs> <last side of laughs> maps go on the wall. Minutes later at 10.15, the dog is barking. Nicole's dog is barking. At 10.45, half an hour later, we hear the thumps on the wall. This leaves us between 9.35 and 10.45 for the defendant to drive from Rockingham to Bundy and back, mm -hmm. a total of 12 minutes, which leaves him a full hour to commit the murders. <sighs> LA traffic. I'd like to see you do that. I really would like to see you do that in 12 minutes in, now in let's LA go back traffic. Let's home at 875 South Bundy. Now I'm going to show you what Sukru Bastepi saw when Nicole's dog took him to 875 South Bundy. Again, very powerful here. Telling him she's going to describe the murder scene. Get that in the jurors' heads. That's what you want to do. Get get that in there so they can they can have this horrific idea and image going through their head. Two hundred watt studio added again with another super chat. Uh, I, I I I purposely haven't read this one yet. I'm I'm preparing myself. Okay, actually, this is a blow <laughs> blow up of a page 
from a Thomas guide, a binder of maps of Los Angeles you used before GPS. Oh, good. That was a safe message to read. I had I had prepared myself <laughs> for something more in line with the last messages, super chats <laughs> from you. Mm. After 10, how much traffic in a neighborhood? This is the view. Brentwood, maybe the not walkway. a lot, this I is guess. From the but sidewalk area at the end of the walkway at the foot of the steps, you see the body of Nicole. She's wearing the black dress that she wore at the Mezzaluna that night. And if I remember correctly, they purposely didn't show any of the uh, the victim photographs in the trial. Officers Risky and Terrasas were the first officers to arrive at the scene. They got there at 1213. That's 12.13 a.m., shortly after midnight. They immediately contacted Mr. Bastepi and his wife, who pointed to where they had seen Nicole. Next. What you see here is what officers Risky and Terrasa saw when they arrived at the scene. You can see here the paw prints of a dog. Officer Risky, Officer Risky business. will describe to you what it was he saw when he got there. They were the, the same paw prints, no shoe prints, only dog prints up and down this walkway. Yeah. Is, is the law patrol, law patrol, are you still here? Because I have to admit, occasionally when I, when, when I, when I see law patrol, I think paw patrol because it reminds me of, of, of my childhood. <laughs> In order not to disturb the blood or any of the evidence, Officer Risky and Terrasas walked up the side where you see the bushes next to the walkway. P -10. They walked alongside. It would be to the left side of the walkway. Can you give me just a moment before you bring up the next one to let me know and let me know what it is? Because I indicated to you I do not want to let out a video feed of certain items. Thank you. Yes, we are covering O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Officer Risky went all the way up to the uh, end of... Robert, you got no notification? Well, that sucks. Uh, yeah, again, check to make sure your notification things are on. And even if it is on, there's no guarantee. Because Ky YouTube kind of sucks about notifications. And they drop subscribers all the time for no reason. So make sure you're still subscribed if you have subscribed. If you hasn't, eh. Uh, 200 watt studio. Thank you again. Officer Risky was known for overeating fast food. You're not wrong. <laughs> the walkway in the bushes to where to a point where he was able to see at that point that it was not just Nicole, but also Ron. Your honor. This one. Yeah, see, unsubscribing my mod. What the fuck is up, is, is up with that, Thank YouTube? You. Seriously. You see here, Ron Goldman. As he was found by officers Risky and Terraza. Now, what you're not going to be able to see in these photographs, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that Nicole Brown's throat was hideously slashed. And you'll be able to see, and the evidence will show, that her murder took very little time to accomplish. The same goes for Ron Goldman. As a matter of fact, what you will be able to see in this case that I'll describe to you now is the area in which he was confronted. Oh, she's going to describe her area. Attacked by this defendant was very small. He was literally back into a cage where he had nowhere to run. And that is how his murder was accomplished in a very short amount of time. You can see the area he's in right there. What you can't tell from these photographs is how small, how narrow this area really is. It's very small. He's bordered on one side by the rungs, you can see by the fence, and by the other at his feet, yet another fence. It's literally, literally back into a corner. Now, so you can see the relationship, how close Nicole and Vaughn actually were. 
have a diagram. More diagrams. The infamous Bundy residence. I wonder if they'll convict OJ this time. Oh, I thought they weren't going to show the uh, crime scenes well, here. Shows you, and this is a uh, board you want to call eight seventy five South Bundy Drive, depicting. I don't remember South seeing Bundy this at trial. And both of the victims. So the victims there. Here we are losing audio. All right, let's see how long we lose audio for. Hopefully a long time. Skip through. Sidebar. And this is, again, where sidebar became a, 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 ter a vernacular term that people would use because all the time the lawyers are like, sidebar, and they would go up to the side of the bar and talk. So, yeah, the si sidebar entered the uh, common usage during this trial. Peter Watkins, thank you so much for the super chat. This is how you ensure that you've got eight months of content. Lol, no spoiler. No, we're not going through the whole trial. Hell no. Uh, we're just going to hit some good points. Like I said, I want to do the opening statements for the prosecution, the opening statements for the defense, the closing statements for the prosecution, the closing statements for the defense, and some of the evidence things in the middle. Uh, like Cato Kalen, what did he testify to? The limo driver, what did he testify to? And I definitely want to focus for several days on the cross-examination of the L.A. criminologist by Barry Sheck, which, as I've said a bajillion times and will say a bajillion more times, is the single-handed best, hands-down, no-questions-asked cross-examination I've ever personally witnessed in my life. Uh, and as I, as I like to say, and it's probably the hundredth time I've said it, they cross-examined him for eight and a half days on the stand. And he was so discombobulated by the time he finished his cross-examination, he shook the hands and hugged everyone on the defense team, including OJ Simpson. That's how messed up the prosecution main witness was. The defense had him so screwed that he shook all their hands and hugged them. Uh, so those are uh, those are kind of the highlights. And if anybody else has any particular highlights, there we got one. We got one uh, that, that'll be some. We'll be doing some fun highlights too. We we have one highlighted that uh, there was a, a bit early on where Barry Sheck was was reading notes off of a styrofoam cup because that's what he had handy when when he needed to write something down. Uh, Barry Sheck, he's always been a professor at, uh, at Yeshiva Law School, I believe, and uh, he's, I don't know if he still is the head of the Innocence Project, but he used to be, you know, to get the people off that have been wrongfully accused. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to hit some highlights of this. We're not going to do the whole trial, God no, but still no spoilers how this ends. <laughs> 200 Law Studio, again, before Officer Risky was a cop, he was a safe cracker. And Officer Risky in the daytime and Officer Porky's at night. Rawr. All right, that's a la 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 la. Why do we have no audio? Ah, dang it. All right, there we go. We pulled our head out of our audio ass here. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I wish I was drunk. You didn't blow away anyway. Lol, how are we? Hey, it's a beautiful night here. It's nice and cool. But I I left the window open when I started here. And, like the screen open. The mosquitoes are biting the shit out of my legs. But I can't you stand are. up and go over there and shut the window. The screen and, but thanks for the super chat. And it's going to be crime scene photograph. Thank you. P12. All right, this is a view looking from up to down. We did warn you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a case that was going to have photographs that would be very, very hard to look at. We have to show you the evidence, and I apologize for the graphic nature of them, but this is the crime that we're here to, to examine. Again, th th that was a good thing she did there, too. She, she kind of eases them into the crime scene photographs. 
We're, we're looking at some horrendous shit. We've got to look at it because that's what you have to do to fulfill your job as jurors. Uh, Patty B Photography, thank you so much for the super chat. Deeply, deeply appreciated. Thomas Guide, page 30, C4, and you still could never find your destination. Somehow there was a there was a fervor to get the new edition when it came out. And uh, come on, man, says 200 Watt Studio. That was a deep joke. He cracked the safe code and became risky. <laughs> cracked the safe code and became risky thank you for that but patty thank you more for yours <laughs> just kidding you, it's both deeply appreciated oh careful there make sure you use your left hand for that marcia what the officer is pointing to is this ski cap and the glove that I've just shown you in the photographs. You can see it now in relation to Nicole. At the top of the photograph, you can just see the boot of Ron Goldman, and you can see the envelope in between them. The envelope. That is the scene as it was found by officers Risky and Peraza. P13. There's a close up. You can see now underneath the plant, it was harder to see before from a distance, the glove and the ski cap. What you can also see here is the bloody shoe print. We'll be showing you more of those. All right, Ms. Park, I'm going to delete this one video. Okay. Oh, Robert says the prosecution failed at the end of this because they allowed the glove to go on, knowing he had diabetes. And if a diabetic stops taking his insulin, the extremities will swell, meaning the hands. Also, he stopped taking arthritis medicine. The wet leather shrinks he had on latex gloves that don't go in well. There was a hundred thousand reasons not to put that glove on. And Johnny Cochran. Egg Charles, I almost said Charles Barkley. I have a lot of time to look for it. Egg Charles Darden on until Chris Darden. Shit. <laughs> Damn it. Upon seeing <laughs> he, that what you've just he egged Chris Darden into putting that glove Risky on. Went and notified his supervisor who arrived at 1230. A crime scene was immediately set up. Yellow tape was placed in front of the residence and behind the residence in order to make sure that no one would walk in and disturb any of the evidence. After the arrival of his supervisor, Officer Risky entered the condominium. Now, what I should tell you is that when he came to the scene, he found the body of Nicole. He could see the front door of the condo, and it was standing wide open. So she had just come outside when she was attacked. He went inside, thinking that there might be a suspect inside, and looked all through the house. Not a creature not was stirring, not suspect, even a mouse. But he found no evidence of ransacking, no evidence of forced entry, no evidence of a struggle, nothing that would indicate this was related in any way to a burglary. When he got upstairs in that condo, he found the two children, Justin and Sydney, asleep in their beds. Ugh. They were taken quickly out of the condo, out through the rear, to avoid the hideous sight in front of their house. Yeah, I mean, that that's the shitty part of all of it. There's two kids asleep now, in the house saw, when this went down. He had gone inside to clear the house. He came out the front door. And he Patty B, thanks. Door. At least OJ isn't smirking at the photos like walk. Amber heard. Yeah. Okay, Your Honor, this is. Can you kill this? Right, I'm going to turn it off until I have to do something else. Thank you, Your Honor. Pete, it's What I'm showing you here is a shoe print. Again, right here. Heel print. A bloody heel print and another one here. Next. <laughs> Dude looks surprised. <laughs> Just saying. Print. And another one here. Even, even Stanley from the office can't uh, carry off a, a look that surprised. Next. P16. Again. Bloody shoe prints. You can see one set. Of bloody shoe prints as they go down the walkway. Those bloody shoe prints, that one set of bloody shoe prints continues all the way back 
towards the rear alley area where there's the driveway. Remember I showed you earlier on that there was a driveway area behind the condominium where Brigitte was parked. These bloody shoe prints are all in the same direction, leaving the bodies of Niran and Nicole going towards the back area. P17. And you can see them here again in a perspective shot. I'm circling with the red. red well, head. some of you can see them. We don't get to. About halfway down the walkway, they start to fade out as the blood is picked up by the sidewalk. What Officer Risky also saw were that there were blood drops just to the left of those bloody shoe prints. So next to that single set of bloody shoe prints leaving the scene, you had blood drops to the left of them. P18. These markers here indicate where there were blood drops found. And close up. P19. It's a close up of 112 that you saw farther in the distance, the blood drop. P18 again. That gives you the perspective. Now I can show you what I was talking about. Here's a bloody shoe print to the left, blood drop. Off farther, see this one I'm circling here, close up. P21. Another blood drop. You can see that it is to the left again of a bloody shoe print. You can see, if that's a heel you're looking at there. P22. Again, this is in, this is showing you another blood drop that was found going down the. Street. You're gonna have to put these pictures together in your brain, in your mind the here. Walkway going from the front of the house to the rear has many stairs going up and down. See, there are landings going up and down. You see a lot of stairs on this pathway, and on these stairs as well. I'm circling here. That's a blood drop. There were also bloody shoe prints seen here. I think you can even see this one. I'm circling with the pen right now. P23. And that's close up, the one on the stairs. Blood drop. P24. Again, now this is at the rear gate of the of the condo. So we're this okay, we we we're getting lots drops. and lots and lots of blood close of up. blood drops and, and shoe drop. prints on the record here. Okay. Uh well, we already did that when you get a twofer. <laughs> and now the blood drops continue. Oh, I just didn't uh, disconnect all of these. Hmm. All right, never mind. Six. These markers show. Close up. P27. Now she's laying out all this, here, this evidence the here, but Barry Sheck is going to go through here and just wreak all hell with the evidence and how it was collected. Now the shoe prints that you saw. Sensible advice guy. Thank you so much. 1995, Dr. Shoe. Spiegel was still on his first lobotomy. Wears <laughs> size 12. Ooh, OJ Simpson blood size drops shoes. To the left of the bloody shoe prints. When the defendant returned home from Chicago, he was found to have had a cut to the middle finger of his left hand. P35. Mm hmm. The case was assigned to the Robbery Homicide Division. Detectives Philip Van Adder and Tom Lang, the investigating officers assigned to handle the case. They arrived at the scene just after 4 a.m. and they viewed the crime scene and the evidence as I've just described it to you. They found the same things that Officer Risky found. Given the fact that there were two young children being held at the station pending some adult who could take charge of them, uh. they determined that they would go and make notification to the defendant. They then proceeded to the defendant's house. Now they got to the defendant's house at approximately 5 a.m. At that time, they started to ring the Ashford gate and they buzzed and they buzzed, but they got no answer. Now at that point, they could see there were lights on in the house, there were cars in the driveway, but no one was answering. They eventually got the defendant's home phone number, called it repeatedly, but again, they got no answer. Then the detective saw the white Ford Bronco parked at the Rockingham gate. P30.
This is the position in which the Broncos OJ found. might be yawning. He just sat just through two hours of, of Chris gate. Darden Once boring everybody to area, death here is and the her. Gate entrance to the defendant's home. This is the location that Alan Park drove by earlier that night at 1039 and saw that there was no Bronco there at that time. <laughs> The detectives noticed that there was a small spot of blood near the driver's handle of that door. Mm -hmm. The criminalist is pointing to it here. That's Dennis Fung. Yeah, we just wait for Dennis Fung to take That's the stand. Up. You can see how small that spot of blood is. See, again, th this is where the prosecution starts to get into a lot of problems, evidentiary problems. Uh, you, you saw those pictures. You've heard the description. There's blood everywhere. I mean, to the point animals are, are tracking it all over the place. Dogs, it's all over dogs. It's, it's all over people. It's all over the place. But the best they can come up with is a tiny drop of blood. That she remarks about how tiny this little drop of blood is near the door. Not on the door handle, near the door handle of the Bronco. So now you're starting to get into the stuff that you have to come back later and prove. All this narrative, all this story, is it's a good story. And it lays a lot of things out. And it, basically they have to prove that he could get from point A to point B and back to point A again in the allotted time. But even that doesn't mean that he, just because you can get somewhere, you can get down the corner store and come back within an hour. That doesn't mean you, you killed someone or robbed the store. Now we're getting into the stuff they have to prove. They have to explain why this guy left two bodies completely soaked in blood. Where and he and where he had allegedly somehow cut his finger. He says he had the, the cut from before. Uh, how he cut his finger, his knuckle while wearing leather gloves, and why there's only a little tiny drop of blood near the door handle. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means they've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was him that did it. And that requires explaining this blood evidence. This is taken from the rear of the vehicle. P34. Inside the vehicle they saw in the rear cargo area, they were able to see a package that was addressed to Orenthal Productions. <clears throat> Knowing that that was the defendant's first name, they realized that was probably his car. Good job, detective. After all they had seen and failing to be able to get any ad answer at the defendant's home, they became alarmed and they decided they would enter the property to see if they could locate someone or find perhaps another victim. When they went in, they went first to Cato's room. They knocked on his door and they asked him if there was someone there who could assist them. He directed them to Arnell, who was right next door. Cato told the detectives about the loud thumps that he had heard against the south wall of his uh, residence that night and about being there were three thumps the source of those noises. Now you've confused the jury. After he you said three thumps and now noises, you said two thumps. Indicating that it was on the south wall and it seemed to come from the area of his air conditioner. The detectives went out to look to see what could have caused those noises. P36. And this is where they went, the same area that Cato had walked to earlier, but never gotten up to because he was too afraid. The area of the air conditioner. As they approached this area, it was very dark. It, they were unable to see anything until they got closer. P37. P38. And there's the glove where it was found, in the very same location in which it was found that night, right next to the air conditioner on that narrow path. When they saw that glove, they realized that it looked like the mate to the glove that you also already saw at the Bundy scene. Yes, uh, the the cops. One of two things happened: the cops found a bloody glove that had already been there, or the cops walked back there and went, "Oh, look, a glove!" And we we know that cops never, never, never go. Oops, there's a bag of drugs in your vehicle. Um, this is one of the items that may very well have been planted. The problem here is when you have the person who starts finding 
evidence, very important evidence, being racist. Uh, we'll get into that later. Mark Furman, not the best of uh, not the best of cops. Underneath the plant at the foot of the body of Ron Goldman. They then realized that perhaps they needed to secure the residence, and Detective Van Adder then walked out of this pathway and out onto the driveway. I don't ever remember anyone mentioning driveway, any cut in the glove saw, ever. Now that it was becoming light, it was at least six o'clock in the morning at that point. Were blood drops on the driveway that led from the Bronco and all the way into the house. P41. And close up. P42. And there's the blood drop, one of the blood drops that was seen. On the, this Furman the also took the, the fifth when he was right asked if he ever tempered with evidence. In the foyer area. All right, we got to do a quick a little explanation here, here close up. about uh, Officer Furman. Uh, as I said, F. Lee Bailey has represented some incredible people throughout his career. Uh, he was he was the old the, the 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 larger older gentleman there, one of the legendary defense lawyers of all time. Uh, that's why they call this thing the dream team. He was one of the main reasons. Um, he asked Mark Furman a question on cross-examination. Have you ever used the word mm, ninja, uh, hard R? Uh, and and th as, we, as we talked about before, this trial is when that started to become known as the N-word because of Officer Furman's testimony and things, it was used so often that they just started calling it the N-word. Uh, the question was asked, have you ever used the word nah, nah. Have you ever used the word binger? And the answer was yes. N nope, that's not what it was. Uh-uh, no, no, no. This policeman said, no, I would never use the word binger, never. I would never say that horrible word. Are you sure you have never in your, whatever it was, 20 years as a police officer, have never once used that word? Never. And he basically went, he was asked several times whether he ever, ever used the word binger. And he adamantly denied ever using that word in his life. And F. Lee Bailey said, I will not return to this trial until I have concrete evidence that he has used this word before. And he left, and he did not come back for a couple of weeks. But then when F. Lee Bailey came back, he came back with audio tapes of Officer Furman using the N-word in an interview, which I, I believe was a television interview. Uh, I mean, he, he came back with an interview he was, he was given where he was using Binger and that was one of the nails in the prosecution's coffin. When the guy that found the glove is using the word binger, uh, up, <laughs> then you immediately have a racist cop finding, mysteriously finding evidence behind a house that ties your black defendant to some murders of a white person or white people. Uh, yeah, use the, use the N word. He bingered a lot on that tape. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that leads you to, God, there's mosquitoes everywhere. Cause that damn window's open there. The, the word binger was being thrown around a lot, which proves that one of their star witnesses is a liar, which calls into question. You lie about one thing. You can assume they're lying about everything. And then he's asked, have you ever doctored evidence? And he pled the fifth. He, he refused to answer the question on the grounds that it might be self-incriminating. Yeah, Band on the Run. Great song, by the way. Band on the Run. I remember the newspaper headlines when the Furman tapes were released. Oh, yeah, that was big. That was a huge thing. And I really want to show the 
the cross examination by F. Lee Bailey, but we would be we would probably be shut down forever due to that one. Just just by the bingers that are being slung around. Uh, might might have to see if I can uh, edit some of them out or bleep them out. But yeah, that's a, so that's why we're talking about Mark Furman here. Uh, he he was the cop that found the glove that denied ever being using racist language and was eventually shown very clearly to use the uh, okay. Kimmy, okay, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. So he was he was shown to be able to use that that word quite a bit, and that called into question everything he'd done. Uh, Kimmy said, "Legal advice: Turn off the camera and close your windows. We can wait a few seconds." Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll probably do that when we start here. Uh, <laughs> we'll let it, we'll let it play for a second because uh, I'm I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. Weird how mosquitoes come out after these uh, typhoons and whatnot. So yeah, um, that's it. So this all of this evidence about finding the glove behind the air conditioner in a place where no one had noticed it except for Officer Furman really called this into question later. You can see them here. I'm circling them. I'll be right back. Having seen all of this, the detectives then realized that this was not just a, an occasion to make notification, that in fact they had uncovered evidence that indicated that the defendant had committed these murders. They secured the home and prepared to, to conduct a search. Criminalist Dennis Fung arrived at Rockingham at about 7 a.m., where he began to test all of the blood drops they had found. He tested the Bronco, and then he tested the drops on the dr driveway, determined that the drops on the driveway were indeed blood. Then he went to test the glove and found that it, too, contained <laughs> blood. Okay. A search Let me the plug house my headphones in here. Inside the house revealed, among other things, <laughs> she fell over a dog. Pulled socks at the foot of the defendant's bed in the bedroom. P45. You see there the socks that I just spoke of. This is the this is exactly where they were found in that condition. P46. Close up. Those socks were collected along with many other items, and submitted for analysis. Now, the defendant's Bronco, the defendant's Bronco that you earlier saw in Rockingham proved to be locked. They couldn't find any keys for it. They couldn't get into it. So it was towed in a locked condition on to uh, the uh, print shed, which is an area where the police keep large items that need to be fingerprinted, where they can keep it locked up. They towed it to the print shed and did not open it until the 14th when they opened it by use of a Slim Jim. Uh, you'll probably hear some discussion of things that occurred with that Bronco after the 15th, and they may be interesting, but they have nothing to do with the evidence that was recovered on the 14th. And a search for blood was conducted of that Bronco on June the 14th. Those items were recovered, the blood was collected, and it was analyzed. <clears throat> and those those items that we'll be talking about today that were analyzed were recovered from the Bronco on June the 14th. Now, all of the items I've just shown you were collected and submitted for examination and analysis. And what you have here is a trail of blood from Bundy Drive to Rockingham Avenue and into the defendant's very bedroom hmm. linked by the defendant's white Ford Bronco. Do we really, though, Marsha? I'm not going to go into the details right now with you, ladies and gentlemen, about the manner in which evidence was collected. Yeah. Or the manner. And the, the manner in which evidence was collected. That's what Barry Sheck literally committed murder. Well, I mean, and by literally, I mean figuratively. Committed murder on Dennis Fung on the stand for eight and a half days of, pro of cross-examination. Was on what a ridiculously shitty job. He is L.A. Co uh, coroner, coroner, L.A. criminologist did collecting evidence at the scene. Eight and a half days of horror testimony. 
So yeah, you'd probably a good thing you didn't talk about it here. It would just would have made it worse. In which it was all analyzed. We have experts for that. But I do want to make some general comments in order to point out a few things right now, just to dispel any misconceptions anyone might have about evidence collection and analysis. First of all, collecting blood stains is a very simple thing. You or mm, I can do it. Not really. And and I, I tell you this because I'm not that good mechanically or scientifically, but even I could do it. What you do is you take a very small square of cotton and you put distilled water on it and you soak up the stain. There's no magic. Anyone can do it. It's just like you would go and soak up a spill in your kitchen. Not very different. Now, many laboratories or many police agencies use lab technicians for that. You know, people that don't have a bachelor's of science or any particular degree in criminal criminalistics or forensics. Forensics is a science of crime scene analysis and investigation. Many of them don't use anyone with a degree in that, but LAPD does. LA yeah, well, Marsha is correct. Collecting blood is easy, but collecting blood properly to use as evidence is not so easy. LAPD uses criminalists who are people that have Bachelor of Science. That attorney looks like Chuck Norris. In forensic science, <laughs> the science of crime scene analysis. So they actually use people that are overqualified for the job. A likely issue in this case will be the testimony of the coroner. Now, I know that we've all seen, and some of us have seen anyway, Quincy, seen Jack Klugman on television. Quincy, goes out to invest Jesus. Yeah, this, this is old. If you're talking like Quincy. <laughs> anybody, anybody remember watching Quincy? Quincy was a medical examiner show way back in the day. To get the crime and he finds out who did it. In the general course of things, although there is a criminal, there is a coroner's investigator. That no, you're coming up next time I pause. For collecting the body from the scene and getting it to the coroner's office intact. What the coroner does is the coroner looks at the body to determine cause of death. Ladies and gentlemen, I can guarantee you one thing in this trial. There will be no dispute as to cause of death. No one will argue about what the cause of death was. Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. The issue that will be raised is the time of death. Now, what can a coroner do for you with respect to time of death? The coroner can never really be that precise. A coroner can tell you just based on his examination of the body, he can usually bring it down to a range of within three hours, between nine and midnight, between midnight and three. But if you want to pinpoint the time to within a minute, 10 minutes, a half hour or even an hour or two hours, a coroner solely by his examination of the body cannot do it. We always have to, and that's true in any case, in any case, we always have to rely on the testimony of other witnesses, witnesses who will tell you when the victims made a phone call or when they heard the victim leaving the house or when they last saw the victim, dogs barking, the kind of evidence I just talked to you about is often what is used if you want to try and really pinpoint the time, because the coroner cannot pinpoint it to within minutes or even an hour, really, in any case. Now, before I get into the analysis of evidence, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what scientists and criminalists look for nowadays when they examine the evidence. We've made tremendous strides in many areas. Hey, we'll do this real quick here. Uh... Mo Jorison, thank you so much. Has the bulldozer saga ever interested you? Can I persuade you to be interested in it? The bulldozer saga. Are we talking? I, I'm not sure what you're talking about with, about in regards to the bulldozer saga. Are you talking about the killdozer guy? If you're talking about the killdozer guy, oh, stay tuned. Stay stay tuned for that. Uh, yes. Bojor is talking about Killdozer. Don't worry, that's already on the uh, that's already on on the on the menu. <laughs> uh, Killdozer. Kill we'll be talking about uh, Killed at some point in the, in the next several weeks. Talking about the Killdozer guy and comparing him to a substantially similar Australian guy from way back in the late eighteen hundreds. So yeah, stay stand by for. Killdozer, coming up some point in the next several weeks. Uh, and we have Carrie Girl. 
Was AFK back now? Oh, it was, as far as I know, back now. Is there any evidence that can be DNA tested today? They they did DNA testing back then. Uh, and that's, I think, if I recall correctly, that's what she's going to talk about now. Um, and that was one of the things that I think the prosecution, that was another major area where I think the prosecution really, really, really dropped the ball. These were largely older juries, if I recall correctly. Um, probably not the, probably not the uh, most technically inclined people. And they went through the most detailed description of the scientific testing of the blood evidence for, I believe it was two and a half weeks at least. I mean, just, just going over the most minute detail that you in it. I mean, I followed what they were saying, but it was still confusing and boring the shit out of me. And, uh, I, I think they just, they, they lost the jury and I, I, they lost the jury during the scientific evidence portion of the trial and all of that, all of this, well, you know, there's one in whatever hundred million chances it could have been somebody else or, you know, this gives you the probability down to, you know, a, one in a bajillion at the end of the day, you put the glove on, they go, well, ah. Uh, I don't really understand all that highly technical, detailed, scientific shit you bored us with for several weeks, but I know the glove didn't fit. That was, they created the situation. I, I think they just, they just way over detailed the scientific and DNA explanation. And it, I mean, like I said, I, I, I sort of understood it, but it confused the shit out of me and it definitely bored the shit out of me. And I would just assume these older people on the jury had no fucking clue what they were talking about. And I remember telling a lot of people when we were watching it just at, at that time going, this is ruining the case. And I think it did. <laughs> Pinochet helicopter tours. Mar <laughs> Marvin Hemeyer is a legend, rational and reasonable. We'll talk. We'll talk about Marvin, and we'll talk about uh, a similarly situated Australian. Um, back to your regularly scheduled program. And again, general, hit the like button and the subscribe button. To solve crimes, the police have to stay at least one step ahead of the criminals. And that means that they have to look for evidence in places and in ways that the criminals will not have thought of. For example, when it became known that you could match fingerprints, criminals wore gloves. Sylvus, yes, we are. From the body of a victim, that's exactly who we're talking about. Ozzy Iron to Man. To dispose of weapons or to use weapons that could be easily disposed of other than guns. And nowadays, it's very common to find cases where no murder weapon is recovered because they're smart enough to get rid of those weapons. So not all criminals figured this out, but the smart ones did. So we look at blood, for example. We test it for DNA. We look at hair and fiber. We examine it microscopically, comparing it to the victims and to the suspects to see if we can exclude them or if it's consistent with them. Now, in particular, the value of hair and fiber is a very unique thing. The reason for that is that through your daily life, you walk around, you shed hair, you shed fiber, you pick up hair, you pick up fiber, and you're not aware of it. It goes unnoticed. It's an involuntary thing, and it happens constantly throughout the day. There's a very fancy term for this, and it's called the low card exchange principle. You don't have to remember that because all it really says is when you go into a place, the environment affects you and you affect the environment. And it's just what I said. You leave hairs and fibers, you pick up hairs and fibers. So, for example, if you have a red couch, an expert can look at your clothing and find the red fibers, look at them under a microscope and compare them and say, first of all, you are near something with red fibers. And if he has access to that couch, can examine and see if they're consistent. That means that they could have had the same source. What the value of this is, is that it shows contact. It shows where items of evidence might have been. It shows who might have been in a given location and who came into contact with who. She's already boring the shit out of me and she's just summarizing what she's going to tell them the shedding goes unnoticed, this can be a very great value in solving crimes. So every crime scene and every piece of evidence has value in terms of being able to help you solve the case. 
Now, with respect to blood evidence, as you know, we've made enormous strides. We have advanced our ability to extract information from blood with the development of DNA testing. This allows us to be far more precise in pinpointing the possible source of a blood stain. And we can also have then the experts tell us how rare it is that you have a blood stain matched to the type. No, the no, it person. did not have to be so damn I'm not going long. to go into the details of all that testing. I'm going to let the experts talk to you about that um, when they come in and testify. But they will. They'll come in and tell you about all of the processes, and they'll explain how rare it is to find a match between a blood spot in a place and a particular person. Now, the defense is going to speak to you at length about contamination and all the problems that could ensue in the testing, but I'll simply say this at this point. There are safeguards built into the DNA tests that you will hear about, and these safeguards will show when problems occur. This is one of the reasons why DNA testing is so reliable, and you'll see that in this case, we have many blood stains, as you've already seen, not just one. You might question it if only one of many blood stains came back to a suspect. But when one after another, after another, after another matches the same person, then you realize that the testing is accurate, that it works, and that if there was contamination, it wouldn't keep coming back to one person. It just wouldn't come back at all. And she kind of had to do this because she knows the defense is going to just pound them on uh, collection and improper collection contamination. She knows it's coming down the line because they've dealt with all of the pretrial motions, all of the discovery and everything like that. So she knows what they're going to argue. So she kind of has to say they're going to, they're going to talk about contamination, uh, but it, it's not really an effective argument, but she unfortunately also has to put the idea into the jury head jury's heads herself that there may have been problems with collecting evidence right after she told them that anybody can do it. So eh, she's kind of had a, the, the defense really put her in a bad position. And although we're talking about science and sometimes just saying that word can make us uncomfortable, all you're going to need saying the word science makes us uncomfortable is common sense and logic to follow this evidence. That's all you'll need. Now, DNA testing is not only used to solve crimes. It has many other purposes as well. Some of you talked about Jurassic Park, and they used it to make dinosaurs. Can you believe that this, that Jurassic Park is this damn old? Can you believe that? That's how old this that movie is but there are other more common uses for it as well. For example, it is used in the amniocentesis. We talked about that in your questionnaire and in, when we talked to you during the voir dire process, if you recall. That's the process where... Say jury selection, not voir dire. ...may have a genetic defect. Most of you are familiar with that, either by first or secondhand experience. And what happens in that process is that fluid is extracted from the mother's stomach, from the sac, and that's amniotic fluid. That's the fluid that the baby floats in to protect it. They analyze that fluid to see if the baby has a genetic defect. Now, that procedure has many of the same problems. Yes, go through Porter, please. Your Honor, while uh, counsel's approaching sidebar, if we could maybe take just a little stretch break, stand up, just stand up. <laughs> maybe the jury would like to do one. Maybe we want to get the jury thinking about something else. Um, stretch, stretch, stretch. Sidebar, sidebar. Here's Barry Sheck over there in the corner. Johnny Cochran, court reporter. All right. Thank you, counsel. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let me, I'm sorry, let me, let the court reporter, good. Norm McDonald, the dream team Just settled their differences this tell. week and showed admiration uh, for one another after events, OJ threatened to uh, cut their heads off. Take a, an unscheduled comfort break, and we will take regular. An unscheduled comfort break means you gotta piss. That's court speak for you gotta piss. Uh, but yeah, Norm Norm McDonald, uh, 
was basically fired from Saturday Night, Night Live because he would not stop making O.J. Simpson jokes. Regular breaks. But if something comes up, feel free to raise your hand because it's going to happen to me during this trial. I'm sure it'll happen to one or two of you during the trial. So if we have to take an unscheduled break, that's life in the big city. We can deal with it. Feel free to let us know. All right. We are going to take our regular breaks. You should expect about every hour and a half. Shut up, Lance. All right. The amniocentesis procedure has many of the same problems that crime scene uh, analysis does. And those problems are this. You have limitations in quantity. There's only so much you can get, right? If you go to a crime scene, you collect the evidence that you find. And you're limited by that. The same thing is true of the amniocentesis. First of all, you can't withdraw too much fluid or it will endanger the baby. Not to mention it's very uncomfortable for the mother. You're limited in quantity then in both situations. You also have a problem with a mixture. No. By that I mean Lance was scene, Lance Edo wasn't the worst judge ever. Blood, he was actually a very good judge, other, very fair in his rulings. Defendant. He just got caught and up in the camera culture. He he started to play to the cameras and things like that. It just it was a bad look, but he was actually I think he did a pretty good job as a judge. Well you might pick up cells from the mother and then you're analyzing for the genetic makeup of the mother instead of the baby. So they have to know how to separate that out in case it happens. So you have very similar situations. Another situation that is similar to crime scene analysis um, is identification of the war dead. One of the tragic aspects of dying in a war is that sometimes we're left with nothing but body. <laughs> One of the tragic aspects of dying in war? How about dying in war is a tragic <laughs> effect of dying in war? I know she was trying to say that you know, it's, it's sad that sometimes we don't get to identify all of the bodies and we have to use DNA evidence to identify casualties of war. But <laughs> one of the really bad things about dying in war is uh, having to... Yeah, whatever. But uh, Ki Kitty Cat asks a really good question. Legal Vice says, what the fuck is up with the hourglasses on his desk? Ito didn't own an egg timer. That was one of those weird things. And this is one of the things that he was criticized for, for being, you know, Mr. Social Media, well, well, television media, Mr. TV media, and playing up to the cameras because he had a, he had a, he had a, 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 an hourglass on his desk. And then someone gave him another. And then it sort of became this thing where people would send the judge in the murder trial hourglasses and he would collect them on his desk. Uh, yeah, just, it was, it was stupid and it didn't need to be done. And he was highly criticized for it. Yeah. So, um, he, he got an hourglass collection during this trial. So that, that answers the, what the fuck is up with all the, uh, <laughs> the, the hourglasses on his desk. Now let's have uh, Marsha quickly tell us what, uh, one of the really, really bad things about being killed in war is dying in a war is that Sometimes we're left with nothing but body parts, and we have to be able to identify whose they are. They it doesn't make him a bad identity. judge. It just makes him a not a very savvy DNA judge. And determine if it matches to, if that goes into a parental thing. You have to take the parents, and then you can tell based on what the parents' makeup is, whether this was their child. That's one way of doing it. It's called paternity match. DNA testing can do that. Now, obviously, the body parts, tissues, or organs that are found in war dead are found out in jungles, in deserts. They're found in terrible places where there's going to be a lot of deterioration. And it's difficult, the same way as in a crime scene, because in a crime scene, it's messy and dirty out there. It's going to be in a street, a sidewalk, a house, a car. That's not a laboratory situation. Well, it's the same thing with the war dead. You have kind of um, unfavorable conditions that are going to deteriorate a sample very rapidly. And so you have a similar problem with non-criminal crime scene uses as you do with crime scene uses. And yet DNA has been very successful in identifying the war dead. Another way that DNA has been used that is not in crime scene analysis is in identifying old remains. By that, I mean skeletons. They can extract the DNA from skeletons to determine the identity of the people that once the, those skeletons were. And they did that recently to identify the Russian royal family that lived back in 1917. 
which we talked about on Fair and Balanced a couple of weeks ago, the the unexplained, the Romanov family. Very powerful tool that is useful in many, many ways. This was the early, early, early days of DNA testing. And in identifications that are necessary in other areas. Now, there are a couple of approaches to DNA testing that can be taken. The first one, you're going to hear these terms a lot, so I'm going to start you today, is RFLP. And right that there, stands for right there, fragment. right here, you have just lost probably nine of the 12 jurors. I mean, including all of the uh, the alternates. Today is RFLP. That stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. Poly you just lost everybody right there. You just lost the jury. And this is why I'm going to be giving her an overall grade of C for her presentation. She started out very, very well until she got into the scientific shit. And now she's just lost all of the momentum she had. If she hadn't already done so with her weird amniotic deal and talking about one of the really bad things about being killed in war, if if she hadn't have lost her steam by then, she just lost it with these words that came out of her mouth. She had this great case. She was building good arguments. She was making good points. It was logical. It was persuasive. It was checking all of the boxes she needed to check. And now she's going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes bort just boring the shit out of them with this, giving up all advantage, giving up all momentum and making them fade out and f just enter into the twilight zone like they did during the entire Chris Darden presentation. Morphism. And that's all you have to know is RFLP for now. The experts will explain everything to you at the appropriate time. That is a very powerful tool used to pinpoint the identity or of the person who left blood or hair or fiber, or, excuse me, blood or hair or bodily fluid in an area. Very powerful tool. Another DNA test, not quite as powerful, yeah. but still you more powerful. You need new Godzilla posters to swap out every now and then PCR to entertain the vice squad. Polymerase chain reaction. Well, only the top one is a poster, and that's from, from the 1953 movie DNA. with Raymond Burr. Below it is an actual road sign, like, Xerox it. like a reflective, and legit road sign painted so with Godzilla on it. And that's been very, very powerful tool as well in analyzing and determining the source of a stain or body fl bodily fluid that you find at a crime scene. Hey, Statuesque Miss is here. Regardless Welcome. Regardless of the used, whether it's RFLP or PCR, they're both DNA testing. And the tests are really tests of exclusion. What does that mean? Ugh. That means that when you conduct these tests, the effort is to exclude. You analyze the DNA and you see, can I exclude the suspect? Can I rule him out? Yes, Is there yes, anything yes. here inconsistent with the suspect or the victims, depending on what you're looking at? And that's exactly what was done in this case. Brie Cormier, I wonder if these prosecutors could actually get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. Yeah, that's what that's the saying that uh, you know a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich. Uh, that was the focus. Maybe this one couldn't. And that is the aim of DNA testing. Thanks for the super chat. In this jet. case, we asked this question over and over and over again. Can the defendant be excluded? No matter how hard we tried, over and over, the samples were tested and retested and tested again. Over and over again, we asked ourselves, can the defendant be excluded? And over and over and over again, the answer was no. The defendant cannot be excluded. I would now like to briefly summarize for you all of the test results of the analysis of the evidence ah. I've just described. And Drew, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, uh, but I, I mentioned that I think I forgot to read your super chat from yesterday and I apologized and I read it. So if I didn't do it yesterday, I just want to let you know that, uh, I, I did at the beginning go back and, and hear that. I, if I did forget, I deeply apologize. And I'm going to start with the hair and fiber. Now, the hair and fiber is just is microscopic analysis. It is not DNA. Okay, This is the comparison of hairs and fibers that were found on various items of evidence and in locations at the scene that were compared to the defendant, 
the victims, and various other items of evidence. It's easier to explain to you if I actually tell you the results. P14. The ski cap that was found at the feet of Ron Goldman was examined for hair and trace analysis, and it was found on that basically that there was fiber like those from the carpet of the defendant's Ford Bronco. I believe Robert Shapiro said he got about 2% of the Stop fees that. he was supposed to have gotten. Why would there be carpet fibers like those from the defendant's Ford Bronco? That's true. Okay. Just state what the evidence is. Thank you. Yeah, don't also speculate. Also on that hat, we find hairs like those of the defendant. which is what you would expect to find on a hat worn by the defendant. I have lots of hats, but I don't one. think any of them have any carpet fibers from my, my Jeep. Your Honor, before we pull that up. It'd be scary okay. if they did. Thank you. On the shirt of Ron Goldman, we find a head hair like that of the defendant. Not like that. Was it his or not? Don't say like his. On the glove found at the defendant's home at Rockingham, we find hair like those of Nicole Brown, hair like those of Ron Goldman, fibers like those from the shirt of Ron Goldman, and fiber like those found in the carpet of the defendant's Ford Bronco. And unfortunately, she's making a big deal of this when it can pretty much easily be asked away by okay uh was was defendant oj simpson known to visit her at her house did she ever visit him at his house okay therefore that's where this evidence came from This shows you the defendant's Ford Bronco. You see the tags? Those all indicate blood spots that were recovered on June the 14th. I believe there was three or four, not all of those. The blood stain on the panel, and that I'm going to try and indicate it with the red <laughs> line because it's at the edge of the photograph where that tag is. Cool. That blood, as well as the blood on the that blood on the uh, panel matches the defendant. P49. The blood indicated here with the number 34 matches the defendant. P50. Okay, so his own blood is in his own vehicle. Big deal. Especially when he had a cut on his finger blood that he said he had here several here days before. Matches the defendant. P51. Blood on the console. He was found liable for wrongful death matches the defendant. in the civil proceedings. The item number 31 on the console, consistent with a mixture of the defendant and Ron Goldman. P53. This blood stain was on the console. This was recovered later in time, after the 14th. That is consistent with a mixture of the defendant Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. P54. The blood stain found in this area marked with the number 33 matches Nicole. P40. On the Rockingham blood trail, the item number six. This is. They don't have a close up of it. This is not something that you, I would recommend doing. The diagram during the this is not something I would recommend doing in, in opening statements. It's just nobody gives a shit at this point. You know. You, you think so what? And she has lost everything. 
that she had going for her from the stories in her earlier presentation. Just to say, we're going to present an absolute mountain of evidence, like Amber, but actually show it. We're going we're gonna to show you an absolute mountain of evidence that directly links him to murdering these two people. We'll explain what it is, how we got it, and what it all means to you as the trial goes on. You can do this in 30 seconds, powerfully. Don't go through this bullshit item by item. By, you're going to do it later in trial for two and a half weeks. Two, two and a half weeks, whatever the hell it was. Don't spend an hour talking about it now. Just say we have blood, we have hair, we have carpet fibers, we have a mountain of evidence that links him directly to these murders, and we'll get to it. Ugh. In the trial. Lost potential. The uh, blood spot number six matches the defendant. So... This is the blood spot number seven we showed you before. Close up. Matches the defendant. Oh, Jesus. Vicky, absolutely. Is this, tri is this trial considered something for future lawyers with, not, with what not to do? Absolutely. I tell people whenever they ask, because a lot of people are, are under the mis, uh, misapprehension that this was like the greatest trial of, of the last century. Absolutely not. It was stupid. It was ridiculous. It, 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 it was awfully, it was horribly presented. Yeah, this is what I tell people. This is online available to you, a master class in how not to do things. P42. P43. Again, the blood drops that were found just inside the front entry of the defendant's home. Uh, this is blood drops number 12. P44. Matches the defendant. <laughs> P45. He didn't go to jail for this, but he did go to jail later for stealing his own stuff. True story. He just got out of jail a uh, very short Socks time ago. That we a few months ago. We were found in this condition, thrown hastily at the foot of the defendant's bed in his bedroom. He called some guy that had some of his analyzed. stuff to a hotel in Vegas and pointed a gun at him and robbed him, P46. robbed this guy of OJ's own stuff. It was determined that the blood on one spot matched the defendant. The blood on another spot matched Nicole. He, he was held in custody. He was he was under arrest. That was that's what the whole Bronco chase was about. The gloves that was they, found they arrested the him like five days after the, the murder. Defendant's property at Rockingham revealed blood that was consistent with a mixture of Ron Goldman, Nicole Brown, and the defendant. P19. These are the blood drops at the Bundy location at 875 South Bundy. This blood drop that you see here. Marked with the item number 112, matches the defendant. Can you explain the Chewbacca defense? Matches the defendant. Oh, God. Matches the defendant. Oh, that's such a risk. Matches the defendant. Let's, let's see. Matches the defendant. We'll get to it after this, I think. Apart from the test results, ladies and gentlemen, the mere fact that we find blood where there should be no blood, in the defendant's car, in his house, in the, in the driveway, and even on the socks in his very bedroom, at the foot of his bed, that trail of blood from Bundy. Hey, Alan, welcome Ford back. Bronco, and into his house in Rockingham. I hope things are better. Devastating proof of his guilt. And the results of the analysis of that blood confirms what the rest of the evidence will show. That on June the 12th, 1994, after a violent relationship in which the defendant beat her, humiliated her, and controlled her, after he took her youth, her freedom, and her self-respect, just as she tried to break free. Orenthal got James to break free. Life. 
in what amounted to his I final control. I want to break free from it all. Control. And in that final and terrible act, Ronald Goldman, an innocent bystander, was viciously and senselessly murdered. Remember that in voir dire, we asked you if you could use your common sense and reason to fairly and to objectively evaluate this evidence as neutral, impartial judges of the facts. You all promised that you could and you would, and we believe that you will. We have every faith and belief in the fact that you will all keep that promise, but it will not be easy. You will be tested and tempted throughout this case to accept the unreasonable and be distracted by the irrelevant. This was, I was in law school when this was going on. And they'll insinuate many sinister things based on those possibilities. Possibilities of contamination, possibilities of setup, all in an effort to explain away all of the physical evidence. And they did a good job. But possibilities alone do not equal proof. You've heard the instruction that says that all matters subject to human affairs are capable of some possible doubt. That's why the standard is reasonable doubt. And you'll hear the word reasonable more than once in the jury instructions, and you already have. Because if the proof standard was beyond all possible doubt, there could never be a conviction. There can always be a possible doubt about something. The question is whether you have a doubt that's founded in reason. So beware of the efforts to get you to accept the unreasonable, be distracted Wait, by what they miss? and to base your decision on speculation, on mere possibilities with no hard evidence to show that any of them really occurred. Listen carefully to all the possibilities. I've got the stash. The raised by the defense and ask yourselves, is there any proof that any of these possibilities actually occurred? Listen carefully for the defense to explain how the defendant's blood got on 875 South Bundy Walkway. It's going to be up to you, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to have to be ever vigilant in acting as the judges in this case. Each one of you is a judge. Each one of you is a trier of fact. You have to examine all of the evidence very carefully. And as you do so, ask yourselves. This, this is a thing. California people talk slowly. Does this make sense? Would I look at this evidence the same way? Sounds like argument to me. Look at the evidence the same way as you would for any other case. Now, winning is not what this is about. This is not a game. This is about justice and seeing that justice is done. Two people have been brutally murdered and the evidence consistently will point to the guilt of only one person as their murderer. Nothing what the evidence will show. Are you about to conclude? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There was no rush to judge. And you don't want to have your, your opening statements interrupted like that. Filed. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that as of June the 15th, many DNA results had already been returned. As of June the 15th, there had already been a match between the defendant and the blood found at Bundy Drive. Hmm. There had already been a match between the victims and the blood found on the glove at his house. Many things were known, and yet it was examined carefully, the entire case examined very carefully, and was not filed till two days after those results were obtained. My job is to seek justice. I've had cases before this one. There will be cases after it. This case is not about the lawyers, myself, Mr. Hodgman, Mr. Darden, or Mr. Cochran. We have to remember what this case is about. And justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, if those words are to mean anything, we must all be equal in the eyes of the law, and we cannot use a sliding scale to judge guilt or innocence based on a defendant or a victim's popularity. We live in very, very strange times. Council, this, this has all been argument for the last five minutes. I'll wrap up, Your Honor. Please. <laughs> we cannot succumb to the temptation to thwart justice and throw truth out the window. Council, I'm going to stop you right here. I've warned you three times now. All we're asking is that Council, you... I'm, I'm, I'm warning you. I've warned you three times now. I'm concluding right now, Your Honor. Oops. Please. May I? Please. <laughs>
Oops. All we ask is that you stay focused on what the case is about, about the murder of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. Thank you. Yeah. Not the greatest way of wrapping that one up, was it? Yikes. And he was absolutely justified in doing that. Getting getting rammed for giving argument rather than an opening statement. Yikes. <laughs> Elaine needed some of that, right? Oops. <laughs> Steph, hey, welcome, Mod. Oh, you're you're getting here and you're disappearing. Hello and goodbye from Miami Legal Vices and Vice Squad. Just had to say that Marsha's hair still reminds me of Rick James. <laughs> nice, nice Rick James blast there, Steph. Good to have you here. Miss your big pink super chats. Thank you so much. Always, always appreciated. Never, never refused and always, always waited for. Uh, Drew Bradley, strange times. Boy, she has no clue what strange is. Fast forward to 2020. Yeah. Well, that's the end of that's the end of uh, the opening statements for the prosecution. The uh, what we'll be doing next time. The next time we will be uh, looking at the defense arguments, which were a hell of a lot better. As we said, I, I give Marsha a C, a solid C. I thought she got an A for the first half and an F for the last half. And that just averages out to a C. Uh, yeah. I think that's just kind of it. You know, it's uh, it, it, it was it was very well done. And then it just went off the rails as soon as she left the opening statements and went into an evidence analysis and ended with argument. So yeah, next again, next time we'll be starting off with the defense. They did a, uh, they did a, a, a double, a double defense opening statement as well. And we'll be looking at that. Now someone asked uh, about the Chewbacca defense. The Chewbacca defense is a thing. It's a it's a it's a legal strategy where the defense lawyer just wants to confuse the jury rather than attack the evidence presented by the prosecutor. So when the, when the prosecutor is saying something, they're presenting evidence, and whatever the defense response is is just designed to confuse the jury and draw attention away and ignoring the evidence that's the chewbacca defense if you want to see the chewbacca defense in action and we're just going to do it now because it will be easy to crop out if uh if it gets yeeted um here is the chewbacca defense in action <laughs> and we can just chop it out at the end if, if it gets a if it gets struck but uh, your favorite fan and mine, Legal, Legal Eagle, he reviewed this. So, yeah, well, all right. Well, <laughs> that didn't take very long. Uh, uh, heads up. We've detected copyright audio and video in your stream. Your stream may be attacked. So, yeah, um, we're just pausing this here until this little sign goes away. It says your stream may be temporarily blocked. Damn, this is really funny. And I, I, I don't want to lose this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but see, this is the thing, comedy, you shouldn't have to pause on comedy because every time you pause, you lose the momentum of the joke. Oh, I hate doing that. Damn it. What the hell? All right. Uh, oh, shit. They're watching me you know, turn off my... Okay, stop it. Who's sending me messages at midnight? All right. Uh, all right, we've got to pause here a little bit. Let's bump the speed. We should listen to it in like Spanish or something. Uh, we'll bump the speed up a little bit and we'll pause it as much as I can with trying without destroying the joke. Okay, so again, the joke is uh, whether or not Chef wrote this song and... This is the defense. 
to whether the the, the allegations that of, of who wrote the song. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Chewbacca is a Wookiee from the planet Kishik, but Chewbacca lives on the planet Endor. Now think about that. That does not make sense. <laughs> so there, there we go. Just pausing this. <laughs> The it doesn't make sense. That's his defense regarding the writing of the song. He's from Kizik, but lives on Endor. It makes no sense. Oh, <laughs> oh no! The Chewbacca defense is working. None of this makes any sense. Best defense ever: the Chewbacca defense. This makes sense, and so you have to remember when you're in that jury room deliberating and conjugating the Emancipation Proclamation. Does it make sense? Damn it. Got another warning. And this, uh, anyway, we can see where this is going. We're only halfway through. There's no way we're going to make it through if, uh, if we keep playing this, but that's, that is the introduction to the Chewbacca defense. So <laughs> just, just search YouTube for uh, South Park Chewbacca defense and uh, you'll, you'll get it. But yeah, that, that was just a funny thing. When, when whoever it was asked uh, if I can explain the Chewbacca defense. Uh, Robert, thank you so much. So is the Chewbacca defense the legal version of a magician's sleight of hand? Um, no, that would be subtle. A magician's sleight of hand is subtle. Uh, this is just bullshittery and diversion. I mean, it's a joke. It doesn't really exist. Uh, but yeah, that's the Chewbacca defense. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Robert. And Flux, thank you for another super chat. I don't know if this is if this new phone or you unboomering yourself, but no more freezing yet. No, the freezing deal. Uh, I resolved the freezing thing last week. Um, that was just. It, it turned out that I mean everything. The the strength of the internet was perfectly fine. Everything was fine all the way down the line, all the way to the end user. The problem was I had major, major, major packet loss. For something, so all my little data packets were going, and they just weren't going anywhere. Uh, I had like a ninety-six percent packet failure rate, so I'm surprised you got anything. Uh, but I just had a, a hard reset from the uh, from the internet provider. They blasted my modem with some sort of pulsey sort of thing. Uh, the the main the main not my modem, the main house router, and that reset everything. And since then, there's been no problems. But if you want to think it's because of your brand new phone, Flux, great. Because some for some reason you blame me for breaking your phone. So hey, give me the credit for for fixing it, or I give you the credit for your new phone fixing me, or whatever whatever you're trying to say, whatever you want. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to an end here. Two hours fifty four minutes into this. Uh, again, another great three hour long two hour stream. Yay! I'm so super tired. Uh, I need more than an hour sleep tonight. Uh, but what we're going to do again, keeping this in mind, tomorrow will be Andrew from Legal Mindset will be on. We'll be talking about Korean things, societal things, Korean societal things, and pizza. We we, we did the pizza video. Uh, we did the pizza video here the other day. We're going to do it for, for uh, our fellow Korea residents. We'll be learning about the true origins of pizza. Koreans invented pizza, and there's scientific proof of it. Uh, we'll be reviewing that evidence with Andrew tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking about other things. And as you know, whenever we get together, the, the conversation just goes off the rail. So that's what I plan on talking. And if I can talk about at least two of those items, I'll be consider I'll consider it a success. It was great being on with him, uh, Drex, and uh, Mike from Law Talk with Mike uh, er earlier this morning, my time, last night, your time. Uh, that was fun. But So we'll have Legal Mindset on tomorrow. Then... Thursday night U.S. time. I will be on Good Logic stream for a few hours. I'm desperately trying to get Nick tied down to also Thursday night at his usual streaming time, which is 11 p.m. Central. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully, I can get Nick on for for a few hours. Um, that that's my goal. Working on it. If not, we'll reschedule. We'll find another time. Uh, Friday, I'll. There's something I have to do. Like I said, I can't remember what it was, what I had. Oh, Nirvana, the Nirvana lawsuit. We'll be talking about the recent victory in the Nirvana lawsuit on Friday for a while. And then on Friday night, uh, Friday night 
your time, Saturday morning, my time, we will be with uh, Fair and Balanced to do her thing, to do the unexplained on her channel. So there we go. That's, uh, that brings us up to the weekend. And on the way out the door, we got to do the usual thing here. Thank you so much, mods, for everything you do. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the uh, the the new emojis we've got. We've got the new tinfoil hat today for the members. If you want to join, if you want to join the memberships and have access to uh, some members only posts on YouTube, um, and to be able to use the the badges and the emojis or whatever. Uh, hit, click the join button. There's three tiers that start from like things like five bucks a month to thirty, uh, whatever. And <laughs> we have a hundred. Last I checked, we have 140 members. Um, I don't think we got any new members today. Uh, but and if 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 the new membership happens while I'm on stream, I'll make sure to mention it. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. We couldn't do it without you. If you're not here watching, if you're not here chatting with each other, I have no business being here, and the mods have no business being here. So, hey, you guys are the backbone. I tell everybody always that I have the best damn chat on the internet. You guys are great. And uh, that's uh, that's a st my story, and I'm sticking to it. So I will see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for all of the super chats, all of the super stickers, and thank you so much for all of the new subscriptions we got. On your way out, hit the like button. We uh, Right now, we we're down to like 198 because we're wrapping up. We had over 300 viewers, 300 and some odd viewers. Uh, how many likes do we have? 337. Oh, damn. Straight out of the late, right out of the gate here, the late gate. Xcomer, Triple Z, gift, gifted five Legal Vices memberships. So yeah, yeah, click on that gift box and see what happens. See if you can uh, get yourself one of the free memberships. Thank you so much, X Karma. That was, again, ridiculously, ridiculously kind of you to do that. Uh, snack, snap them up while you can. Guess we have to hang around here for, for a couple more minutes so that anybody that wants to get one of these randomly assigned gift memberships, you can all get it. Uh, again, I, no, the chat is the greatest thing ever here. My chat is super awesome. And hit the like button on your way out. Hit the subscribe button. Thanks for you that have. Hit the notification button and come back later. You know, you're going to look at YouTube at some other point after this show ends. So, you know, just come back and make a comment. Make a comment because that YouTube treats the post live stream comments as engagement and it recommends them in people's uh, video recommendation lists. And that's what it's all about. Getting more people here, getting the channel bigger and growing. So all of you, love you all. Oh, looks like Yvette got one of the memberships. Uh, Nancy Rush got one of the memberships. Jack Matt got one of the memberships. That's three... Three, three, two more, a couple of people. Do you actually have to click on the gifted membership box? J-Rob, and let's see. J-Rob, we, okay, we got, we, let's go through these again. Should be five memberships. Oh, there we go. Bren, J-Rob, uh, Yvette, uh, Nancy Rush, and Jack Matt were the five lucky recipients of the five gifted memberships. Thank you so much for XComer. For that XComer, you, you did a good thing. Now, everybody can use the tinfoil emoji. <laughs> All right, I really do need to get out of here. It's midnight. I got some stuff to do. And we're, we're going to go do it. Y'all take care. Have a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening. And if there's anything you want to hear, if there's anything you want to talk about, want us to talk about on the unexplained days or the maritime days or anything else, my email is, uh, what are we at? The, the email is thelegalvices at gmail.com. Uh, my Twitter is thelegalvices at Twitter. And... Our final new member of the day, Floppy X Turtle X. Floppy Turtle became a YouTube member. Thank you so much for becoming a clean and sober member of Legal Vices. 
And on that note, Legal Vices is out of here saying thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and enjoy your Legal Vices. Bye now.